After five and a half hours of standard qualifying here at the Nürburgring Nordschleife, we have reached the real crucial part of the qualification process for the GT3 and the SPX cars, because over the next two hours and 10 minutes, we are looking forward to two separate top qualifying sessions. But the difference here is that the cars will be set off at 10 second intervals. And theoretically, each of the chosen drivers for their various mounts will have the Nürburgring Nordschleife to themselves and two stabs at it. So you can afford a slight error on the first attempt because you will get to go around again here at the Nürburgring 24 hours, the 50th running of this fabulous race. Delighted to say that it's not only me, Johnny Palmer, in the commentary box to take you through Friday night, Friday evening proceedings, but I'm going to be joined for the first part of the session for, by uh, Joe Bradley and Nick Damon. Well, glorious conditions, gentlemen. The Nürburgring Castle on top of the hill there, resplendent in some sort of early evening sunshine. I was a bit worried when I was looking at the sky earlier on that rain might intervene. I like plenty of rain come the race, don't get me wrong, but I think these sessions, where possible, Joe, need to be held on a level playing field. This, for me, Johnny, is the most exciting part of the whole week. Yeah. It's an all-or-nothing session. The pressure on these drivers and, indeed, the teams to get the cars right for this run. It's immense. The, the, the intensity of the night is fantastic. And to have the conditions that you've described are absolutely perfect. Not too hot, not too cold, not too windy, and, more importantly, dry. So we've got a combination of the GT3s, the SP9 cars, and some SPX machines in there too. In fact, yeah, all three SPXs are going to be in this first session of the two, uh, building the regulations as top Q1. And the target here for the now 20 runners in this session is to try and finish in the top four. So it's basically a shootout where we are going to lose 16 cars in this part of the day and their positions in that first grid of 60 odd cars tomorrow at four o'clock will be decided. So we are uh, basically banking in positions 21 back to 40 in the SP9s. Um, and they can't all fit in there, Nick Damon. There are plenty of cars that deserve to be in Q2 already, but it's going to be quite a fight. Yeah, I mean, there's a number of top teams taking part in this event. Obviously, there were two qualifying races. Some of the teams who were here didn't take part in those qualifying races or had problems, so they hadn't automatically qualified through. They're looking for four places. The interesting thing is that when we get to top qualifying two, the draw has already been made for when they go off. So they know that if you are the, the top qualifier in this session, you'll go off 12th. If you're second, you'll go off fourth. If you're third, you'll go off third. And if you're the, the uh, fourth person in there, you'll go off not eighth, because we have got 20 cars go off in order. That's mm. been drawn already. I did wonder how long that was going to take, actually. I thought, we will come in. They'll, be, they'll, they'll obviously have to get some like Bobby Davro in to get the balls all rolled round <laughs> and then pick them out. <laughs> no, it's already been done. Yeah, I was looking forward to that Tom Bowler <laughs> type draw on the main straight, actually. I'm just not thinking, uh, who will know who Bobby Davro is, Nick? You're going to have to explain that one. But maybe another time. Maybe in the night. Maybe time. Play, yeah, three or four nights on the morning. Yeah. That would be ideal. Sorry, I mean, do you not immediately think of uh, 80s TV stars, think of someone driving Tom Bowler? Uh, Straight, did you know? Um, I'm wondering whether Walter, Walter Hornung, who is the clerk of the course again here at this uh, great event, that's the voice we can hear, I think, in the background, quite possibly. Uh, but uh, anyway, Walter uh, will have been, well, he's been a busy boy along with the rest of his team in race control because um, the. Uh, one or two of the kind of key protagonists going into this session have already been given some penalties, including for the number one Porsche, which is run by Manti in the Grello colours. They were victorious yesterday, according to the big old book that I bought a couple of days ago. Uh, the image of their car emblazoned on the front. But we know for a fact that that car's going to have to start the race at the back of start Gruppe 1. Even in the pit lane, we're not quite uh, sure about well, which the penalty he got yet, because it depends if it's a German penalty or the English penalty. And by that, I mean the English language penalty or the German language penalty. Yes. So it's either starting at the back of that particular group, because of course they go off in three groups this event, or it's starting after the first group, and that gap in the group, but from the pit lane. So not only will it be at the back, it'll be a few seconds further back as well from there. But then again, it will avoid the carnage in the first corner, so... So that might be the thinking other, yeah. behind the pit lane um, yeah. start, but that, but actually. But to give you a point, as far as we know, that number one car will not be taking part. Yeah, according, according to a tweet from Lawrence Vantor. 
I maybe? believe so. Yeah, there, that, there's that certainly the been some social media ridge from one of those drivers to say that's us out of the session now. And there's something I suggested in one of our earlier broadcasts. It done to, to me. It seems the sensible decision because why would you risk the car on single qualifying when you know you're starting from the back anyway? Well, that that came from the team, and it makes no sense whatsoever because it doesn't matter what happens tonight. It's not going to change where you start, as Nick described. You're still going to start there. So why why would you bother? Why why would you unless, unless of course you well you certainly wouldn't bother running a qualifying setup. You might as well get the car ready for the race. Um, and unless you want to test a system, you've got a couple of you know a little bit of time on the track. I'm pretty sure that that team doesn't need any more running no. here. They've had, they've got. It's not data acquisition. They're not going to need that. It's, it makes, it makes complete sensible sense if that makes any sense. There is um, not to run tonight. Yeah, because there's zero reward for any element of risk. So what's the point? You know, and also putting miles on the engine, miles on the gearbox. Yeah, you know, it's no point. Well, you could, you can spend the time more uh, readily getting the car ready for a 24-hour race rather than a one-lap uh, optimized run. Cars right. rolling for the 10 minute free warm up at the start of this process. You've got uh, the uh, happy back in the pits again before 1801. It's currently 1751 local time, and they will then start them at the intervals. Do we know how, what the intervals are between the cars? It's usually 10 seconds between wow. the two. Um, yeah, so it's pretty swift, and there is always a chance because bear in mind, we're going to have pro am cars and pro cars out in the same session. So there's a strong chance, I think, that one or two might catch some of the slower runners that, that uh, you know, drivers have been put in because of their, their, their being pro-am. Um, and the cars that are going to be in Q1 and then potentially going into Q2, there have already been nominated drivers for the second session because the one bit I missed in the rules, to be honest, is that you can't have the same driver in each of Q1 and Q2. Mm. So if you, do, if you are one of the top four cars, you've then got to switch your driver. So, for instance, CP Racing, Charles Espen Laub is labelled as the Q1 driver, and if CP Racing are lucky enough to finish in the top four, it'll be Shane Lewis who does the latter session. And just to clarify for our viewers and listeners, out of these 20 cars that we're about to see qualify, four cars continue into the second qualifying session tonight. Now, you might think, well, what's the logistics of that? It isn't an issue, really. We'll refuel the cars, we'll put a new set of tyres on. These cars are built to go 24 hours, for instance. So having a little bit of a break after, a, after an optimised run and get ready for another optimised run to get you even further up the grid, that's not really going to be an issue at all. The Biesi Crone in the Schubert Motorsport BMW, that car was looking very good, very handy in the three qualifying sessions earlier this week, one of which was held today at 10 past two for an hour. Yesterday evening's was the longest at three hours from 8.30 through till 11.30. But there was also a 90-minute session yesterday afternoon as well. And all the times uh, from those three sessions were, in a sense, combined. So you could have set a provisional pole in any of them. If you're in some of the lower order classes, for instance, Cup X, Cup SP3T, we've already decided pole position cars for those places. All we're doing here is effectively deciding what order the top 40 cars will start at the front of the first starting group. So that's um, 37 SP9 cars and the three SPX cars. But remember, SP9 is split between pro and pro-am driver lineups. And we already have a number of confirmed pro-am machines. For instance, uh, the one of the first cars off um, in this session, which will be the BMW Junior team, uh, in the second session rather, Q2, the 72 crew, which will probably be many people's favorites for a very good overall result. But because Dan Harper, Max Hesse, and Neil Verhagen are still relatively inexperienced, I don't think any of those are gold. And when you add up uh, their precious metal um, via the, the measurement system that the organisers have in place. They are a pro-am team and they will be ninth off in Q2. But uh, two cars running in formation, 33 and 44, both from the Falcon Motorsports outfit, Joe. We've already got problems though, Johnny. The 706 numbered Glickenhaus has come to a halt on the Grand Prix Strecker. Uh, it's just at the kink before the chicane before we head out onto the Nord Life, and that's brought a yellow flags there. Car stranded, um, so that's going to have to be recovered, so the, that might delay the start of the session, the session proper, I should say. One adjustment has been made uh, between the initial list of cars that had pre-qualified and then when that was made um, official, because it, I noticed that there was a temporary list 
and has been there for a number of weeks now, which contain 15 cars that are definitely going to be in Q2. That's now 16, and a few of us in the media centre were trying to work out which car had already got the lucky dog, if you like, without needing to run in Q1. It's the number six Mercedes-AMG Team Bilstein car for Hubert Haupt, Marvin Dietz, Nico Bastian and Gabrielli Piana. So that's three silvers and one gold in the form of Bastian. And that's another Pro-Am car, therefore, as the Glickenhaus is struggling to get up to speed as well. Glickenhaus in by virtue of the fact that it is an SPX car and uh, its allocated driver should be, as long as it gets there, Felipe Fernandez Laza to go off fourth in the order. It's moving again. Good. That's right. I think that was probably a control or delete situation. Uh, the car was just pulled off to the right hand side of the track. Driver's right just coming through the kink before the Vidal chicane. And the car remained, it switched that. Ah, it's slowly going slowly again. And I'm not really sure. He's missed the pit lane, hasn't he? So well, that might be around. part of the plan because, as Nick says, this is effectively free practice or, you know, a, a shakedown, a warm-up ahead of qualifying. It might be that the Glickenhaus, yeah, five minutes to go. So some have decided to already find their positions to drivers left ah. on the start-finish line, and then others might be going around again. He's taken up his position, isn't he, for the, for yeah. the, uh, for the run? So he's got the, he, he must be happy with the car. He hasn't gone into the pits. So the control alt delete, the reset that he seemed to carry out there, out on the back stretch through the kink, seems to have worked. The car's moving and it looks like he's pulled in to his starting position, which is fourth. Yep. He's fourth in the he's fourth in the queue. So Felipe Fernandez Laza elected as the first driver, and if the Glickenhaus does get through into phase two, it'll be Frank Mayer to take charge of the 706. So KTM from AG slash True Racing should be at the sharp end of the field with uh, Tim Heinemann to start that and Reinhard Koffler, the nominated driver for part two. So it's actually going to be a SPX car to start, a Pro-Am SP9 car second, and then the Schubert Motorsport BMW. I fancy Jesse Krohn, once he's waved off 20, mm. 20 or seconds behind, he's going to have some overtaking to do in the first bit of his lap. Now, remember, it's two... Well, there's, there's a flying lap... There's a, a, an out lap, a first flying lap, and a second flying lap. So there is the strong chance that the 20 car will be clear and into um, you yeah. know, decent conditions yes, after that. You're, if you're the 20 car, you're going to be able to make up a 21 car, so you're going to, you're going to be able to make up a, a bit of time to get past there too. But there's going to be some cars in, in this mid-pack who are going to find themselves held up. Mm -hmm. They won't have enough time in even though lap in the flying lap to make up, you know, you look at making up 30 or 40 seconds on some over those two laps, but you'll find you'll be right behind someone. If it's an SBX car, you could lose five or six seconds just there. The interesting thing for me is it's, it's going to be the first time we've had all week where we've got a relatively clear track for these drivers and we're going to see a, a quicker run as, as, as a consequence of that. So, yes, you may have one or two cars to get by, but fundamentally the, 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 the purpose of tonight in this qualifying session is to give the drivers a chance of a clear run around the whole of the 15-kilometre... Miles. 15 miles. 15 miles, 15.3 miles. Mm -hmm. 20 25 kilometres. Yeah. Yeah, that, why does it do that? 25 and 50. Well, because they're two, that's they're right, two different types of measurements. I, I know that, I know that. But let's say, you know, 15 miles, 25, it's 25. I knew there was a five in there. 25.378 to be exact. I'll, I'll now now the brain's working is, straight yeah, in with yeah. the details. <laughs> Very good, Joe. I'm impressed. I'll give you an idea of maybe the sort of ballpark we're going to be thinking about because in the top qualifying session for the qualifying races... Now, remember, we have NLS rounds, but we also have two qualifying races ahead of the 24 hours. And Augusto Farfus, a couple of weekends ago in the 99 BMW, did an 8 minutes, 8 seconds lap. And that's the Grand Prix... Uh, circuit and the full Nordschleife, 808.421 to be exact. And the quickest time so far this week has been in eight minutes 14. Yes, so and a that, long way away. And, and that came about in the first qualifying practice session. It did, that's, when Nicky Katzberg yeah, set that, it. That has stayed there I'm all week. Really not sure there'll be many clear laps since then. That's the problem, yeah. a little yeah, bit yeah. Of, uh, of scuffage around, a little bit of yellow, sometimes a very serious piece of yellow that's, that's, that's caught people out with code 60s. You, as long as none of these guys throw it off on the first lap, it should be that everyone get at least one clear run. That's the one-minute board, by the way, the whistle in the background there. Nice that's the whistle there. for the one-minute board. Nice to see whistles here. 
Well, well, in, this, in this digital world, we have a lovely blowable whistle. It's a proper referee's whistle as well, it like is. a football referee's Very good. whistle. The really yeah. weird thing now is yeah. apparently that KTM's offside. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing we've got to think about is this, this race is completely open tyre. Um, so the Vulcan Horse Motorsport BMWs, I know for a fact, are on Yokohamas. Most of the Audis are on Michelin's. I think the... There's some Falcons in there. There's some, the two Falcon Porsches, 33 and 44. KTM, not sure, actually. I don't think they did the, uh, the GT cars, did they? they? They didn't qualify, they're in the much lower class, aren't they? Yes. So, uh, yeah, it's a lot of the... Is um, that Hancock I can see on the uh, decal on the car? Might no, be. I'm not going to call that one yet. But, uh, yeah, GT-tired cars, yeah, are in the lower classes, but we will obviously uh, put the spotlight on those when we get to the race. The green flag's about to be raised to allow Tim Heinemann in the 116 True Racing KTM to set off. They're Michelin tyres on the KTM from Austria. Next car will be Charles Espenlau in the 21 Mercedes. Just about getting a forward gear there and uh, lighting up the rear Michelins to heat them up nice and early. Then it's going to be Jesse Krohn, and I think the Schubert Motorsport BMW's priority on this outlap will be to try and get by the two cars in front, if at all possible. I'd expect the True Racing KTM to be holding up Charles Espenlau to an extent as well. Clickenhouse away, Felipe Fernandez Laza in the SCG. 004C, then the KCMG Porsche, which received damage in qualifying one after some confusion between the then driver Nick Tandy and pursuing Patrick Pile in the 44 Porsche. The two of them, two former teammates from the same car, many, many times Nick and Patrick mm. uh, came to, um, to, to blows. But thankfully, the KCMG car was able to continue in that session and didn't require too many repairs. It'll be Earl Bamber in the 18, the twin bush Ikeep Vitae. Tess Audi is driven by Pierre Kaffer for this first run. Dries Van Tor in the number 15 Audi. Then the Landgraf Mercedes with Patrick Assenheimer being released. Is there a drama there for the Not Top quite. Sport Porsche? No. 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 There was a gap between Top Sport and the next car that confused me. I thought one had had to duck around the other. Uh, Mathieu Jaminet in the all black. Top Sport WRT. Henry Valkenhorst for Valkenhorst Motorsport. That's a Pro Am car, number 100 goes away. Interesting that Scherer Sport Phoenix have chosen Swiss driver Ricardo Feller in the number five. It's Matteo Cairoli who's designated in both of the Dynamic Motorsport Porsches, but for qualifying, he's just in the 28. Alessio Picariello in the 44 Falcon Motorsports Porsche safely away. The second of the Dynamic Motorsport Porsches is Christian Engelhart. Again, he's eligible to drive both cars when we get to the race. A very late call-up for Dutchman Jeroen Blekemolen in the Racing One Ferrari 488 GT3. I think at the start of the week he got the call to be in the number 14. Then it is the second of the True Racing KTM Crossbow GT2s, Ferdinand Stuck. And if that car gets through, he'll be handing it over to Johannes Stuck for Q2. And the final four cars, the sister Rover Racing BMW is already in to the main qualifying session, but 98, which is the one that's been setting the pace so far when Nitty, Nicky Katzberg did an 8.14.771. Well, let's see whether Sheldon van der Linde can go even faster than that. Patrick Pile is away in the 33 Falcon Motorsports Porsche. David Pittard been chosen as the driver for Q1 in the TF Sport Aston Martin Vantage AMR GT3 car number 90. And the final car, now there's been a, a change here as well because provisionally the number four on my sheet was actually into Q2, but the two get speed Mercedes have been switched around. Four needs to qualify, three, number three is already in. And this is not what we wanted to see, Joe, for the Glickenhaus because at the end of the Grand Prix lap, it's coming to the pits. Yeah, a tragedy. We saw the car come to a halt. We thought the driver had been able to get the car working again. He did a, a, what was apparent, a control or delete. However, the car, having taken the start of the qualifying session, has made his way straight to the pits. And it looks like the car on the trolley jacks and being wheeled into the garage. So that, I think that car is now out of qualifying. That will be starting at the back of this group. Yeah, I think you, well, you have to complete a full Nordschleife lap. Uh, the regulations do not allow you to duck in via the back door to the pits and then rejoin the session because, in a sense, he's missed his spot now. Should have been off as the, the fourth-placed car. So we're down to 19 already, Nick Damon, and uh, a question of, well, just getting the right amount of heat into whichever tyres you've chosen to run. 
uh, but not spending them too much, I suppose, before the end of the 25-kilometre lap because you need to be able to push not only lap one, but lap two if possible as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a case, you know, the, the track is probably continuing to improve. It's uh, The temperature will be quite standard. We've had some rain, so any, any running on it is going to clean it up. Um, the, ca the cars are beginning to sort of clump a little bit because what's happening is if there's a slower car, the faster cars are catching up. So, for example, we have those top three cars now run line the stern. That's the 116, the 21, and the 20, the True Racing, CP Racing, Stuart Motorsport. Uh, currently, um, the, uh, uh, the, the still led by the True Racing KTM crossbow, but I get a feeling that probably on the dotting of home, the two uh, big mm. GT3s will blast past. You know, again, minimum, minimum, minimum risk because you know, once you get the top of the corner, they are now to go through Bergwerk. Perhaps we might try and up through Kesselton as well with the, 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 the flat out run. But um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tactic, isn't it? It, it? it is the option, in fact, of course, to fall back if you think you can find a big enough space. Those KTMs aren't super slow. They're probably eight, nine seconds, perhaps not, not even that off a GT3 lap. So if you can see that gap in front of you, you can drop 16 seconds off to get those two clear laps. That's also a tactic. Um, whilst keeping the warmth in the car, the temperature you want in the tyres, because obviously by going slower, you reduce those optimum temperatures, or as you say, possibly, you actually manage to save your tyres better, Johnny. Or do you wait until you're coming out of tea garden, get a lovely slipstream across the start-finish line and go across the start-finish line five, ten miles an hour more than you would on a normal lap? So um, we're going to see a little bit of tactics here. Uh, they're just coming up towards just about a turn right and head towards the carousel for a location. I'll give you an idea of the, the pace of the quicker of the two true racing KTMs. After three qualifying sessions, it actually got up to ninth place overall, car 116, and they did a, an 8.16.8. Oh, wow. That's about three seconds off then. Yeah, mm. but bear in mind, I think we'll tumble down below the eight-minute tens uh, for the fastest GT3s, and I'm not sure a KTM can get much more off that 8.16. I'll we'll we'll have to wait and see. But they put Tim Heinemann in for the first run, and Reinhard Koffler, as I say, if they do get through in the 116. But all three SPXs should have been in this session. And at the moment, Tim Heinemann has no one with him as he charges hard on the approach to Brunchen. Yeah, a, they, they, they just the guys decided to make space. They're not. They're not. They're, they have taken the information I didn't have, which they're only going to lose four seconds up to the, uh, the crossbow probably, and they're backing off. I'm not quite sure. I think actually that uh, Jesse Cron now is getting more interested in getting past uh, Charles Espen now. Yeah, in space. definitely. Crone uh, looking for a way by the American at every turn of the wheel. There, Ice Curver next for the KTM crossbow. Doesn't look to be a great deal of grip there. And the BMW's already passed the CP Racing Mercedes. So that will be the second car in the order now as they re-emerge at uh, the end of the Dottinger Hoor in a couple of minutes' time, heading to Tiergarten and Hohenrein, which is the real tricky chicane to end the lap. And uh, that link road between the tourist lap part of the Nordschleife proper and the more recently built, although the 80s Grand Prix circuit. So they're now heading actually for Brunchen now and the area where they leave the, the ground and the Schwabenschwanz, which is the second concreted area, with Jesse Krohn having dealt with uh, the slight distraction of Charles Espenlau. But Charles will be fully focused now on trying to get a very good Pro-Am time. It's going to be tough for the Pro-Ams in this session, of which there are one, two, three, four, five Pro-Am combinations. But obviously you don't have to utilise... Um, any of your bronze or silver drivers, sensibly, everyone's put in their quick S driver, but needing to hold back a reserve should they get into Q2. So Tim Heinemann still looking to get some heat into the Michelin tyres at the end of the lap, Joe. Bizarrely, bizarrely, he's been hammering round the Nordschleife. He's coming down the Dottinger Hoare and he's still not happy with these tyre attempts. He's heading down the straight towards Tiergarten, not quite at the kink yet. Still a, still a way to go before you go through that flat-out kick. It isn't really uh, a, a problem for these cars. It's uh, you, you virtually don't turn the steering wheel. You just think the car through the left-hand sweep. And then up towards the tear garden where you really have to switch the concentration on, don't you? <laughs> because you could have an absolutely fabulous lap that can, is completely destroyed by being just sucked into that magnetic aspect of the tear just garden. Just slightly into the barriers. Just slightly <laughs> into the barriers. Hopefully not tonight. Hopefully for no one. I wouldn't wish that on yeah, anyone. Most of the cars appear to be uh, lurching down the uh, dotting a hole like they, they came back drunk from a, uh, a dinner dance um, yes. but I think they are just getting an extra couple of degrees and the first flying lap has been started by uh, the KTM crossbow GT2 number 116 and into that unpleasant little immediate sharp left after you go around turn one quite frankly the most 
awful bit of corner which I think I've ever seen on the racetrack. It yeah. really is. The famous Yokohama S, uh, right and left, or the Haug hook, as it uh, has previously Not been called. Yep, yeah, correct. Ask Bruce from about the, the egg story. From the DTM days. OK, I'll bank that. <laughs> uh, down towards Dunlop Kera, the hairpin at the bottom of the hill. And Tim Heinemann still with no immediate pressure from behind. It's testament to the speed of this KTM and how it's been developed through the years, a crossbow GT2, because Jesse Crone is only just heading into the hairpin now in his ba in the background. He's and Crone, yes, yeah, he's, he's just he's going he's into quicker. the second sector Heine now. Heinemann quicker than Crone wow. in sector one. In fact, Heinemann's so far the quickest in sector one, 40.1. That's in comparison to a 40.4 for Krohn in the Schubert BMW. Uh, CB Racing's Espenlaub, uh, Charles Espenlaub is 41 dead through that first sector. So that that crossbow is a very, very quick race car. And uh, we, there's us thinking that it was maybe Krohn just backing out of it a little bit to give himself a bit of space. I think he's struggling to catch it. <laughs> <laughs> this, of course, is the actual racetrack part. This is the part that the GT2 car excels on a large F1 circuit. Now, everything changes. Now we're on the Nord Schleife and it's, it's uphill, downdale, it's narrow, it's nasty, it's bumpy, and it's not quite the same for any car to perform in. This is where these drivers that are out there tonight earn their money. This is where these guys earn the big bucks because the pressure of running on the Nord Schleife and knowing the job is to optimise every single aspect of it. That's quite an ask, and the, the level of ability and the performance level from the drivers and the concentration level and everything, every on every level, everything is having to be optimised. The drivers have to be really on their game here. Tim Heinemann, still relatively early on in his racing career, he's only 24 from Germany and has run in the ADAC GT4 Championship for a couple of seasons, but uh, ran in Cup X with the a crew that are here this year actually team mcchip dkr uh, and they're not in cup x because that's an old teichman racing uh, division this year but uh, mcchip are here oh now what happened at schwedenkreutz because there was a puff of smoke i think that was from one of the front tires as tim tried to slow the ktm in time for arenberg just briefly unsettling the car but the pace was actually still pretty good, and he barely ran out wide at Arenberg and heading for the foxhole. So dealt with that unexpected moment very well indeed. Krohn's clawed a little bit of time back on in sector four, but still the man who's got the quickest run so far in the sector four is the car that went out first, the 116 crossbow. Uh, fastest car through sector one at the moment, though, is Matthew Jaminet in the Top Sport WRT. Porsche, he went, he went out ninth, and his time, fractions though, isn't it? Just thousands of a second difference. Uh, that's put him fastest in sector one. Still faster than sector two, though. Still the crossbow. Just dealt with the two left-handers at Metzgersfeld. This is Callenhard, the right-hander, and Versiphon coming up too. And we're at the point of the track for Tim Heinemann now, where he's plunging downhill towards Exmuller, which is where, you know, Days gone by, there was a second, or still is a sort of a second entry onto the tourist laps there, but uh, very rarely used. And uh, sections of the track that start to look a little bit the same because you've got the downhill right, then followed by a left, and that configuration of corners is almost repeated before you get to Exmuller properly. As he now goes over the road bridge and starts the ascent to some really quick stuff at Kesselschen, Klostertal, and then the slower right-hand approach to the carousel, partway, halfway up to Hoa Act. And there's definitely a, a racing line of tyre wear that, you know, the rubber's gone down over several sessions and not just the 24-hour cars. I can see that glinting in the sun, sunlight, actually, that racing line, which has rubbered up nicely. This section is completely uphill. You need a really strong engine. You've got to come out of Bergwerk really well because that momentum can just be sucked away, can't it, Nick? Uh, that, that uphill run. And then as you get towards this section of track, now that he's through Kesselschen, he's heading towards the left hander of Klostertal, and this is the left hander that you really need to, dare I say it, muster as much courage as you can yes. but not too much because you really have to be a little bit conservative because it's very easy to use the curb on the exit now he's down towards the right hander that leads to the uphill stretch towards the carousel and the carousel yep yeah, one of the relatively slower parts of this track the banked hairpin 
that you just throw the car into that bank section, the concrete banking that was kind of the iconic feature of the Nürburgring Nordschleifer, isn't it? You've got all those iconic photographs from down through the ages, the Caracciola auto unions and the Mercedes going through that same section of concrete banking. It's phenomenal. Yeah, you, you're fighting all the way. You try, the car's yeah. trying to pull itself out of the bank all the time. And if you do pop up over the crest, it's like second, second half gone straight away. So you've got to keep the, Really, it's left hand out, pulling it around, trying to balance the throttle to keep the car down and move through. And then you get that perfect exit into this Obviously, I would say the most tricky section is you come out from the carousel and you run around the, the, the three, the, the never-ending selection of, of, of fast left, right, left, right, you know, through her act and Rippen and, and Brunchen. Um, and that's really, I think, where what separates the men from the boys and really where the time's made up. Slight concern, I think, for Pierre Kaffer because he didn't come through in sixth position through the last split. Dries Van Tool's got ahead of him. That might just be a bit of inter-Audi understanding and Kaffer allowing through the pro car because, bear in mind, Kaffer's machine is actually a pro-am entry. And there were yellow flags at Hats and Back not too long ago as well. Uh, still being shown, in fact, at Marshall Post 65. And I'm trying to work out who that might have been. Joe's going to check the, the tracker. Well, you check that, Johnny. Hensley, the fastest car, was Sheldon Van der Linde in the Rover Racing seven, uh, number uh, uh, 98. Went off 17th, so he's quite a bad, but he's gone through yeah. four sectors, every single one in purple so far. So Van der Linde is definitely saying one going to do it on lap one. Uh, he's actually got the true racing crossbow which also um, has disappeared after two sectors so that's interesting well that that is the problem at hats and back it's the 117 uh, true racing ktm of ferdinand stuck now you don't often have a small moment at hats and back the swing of corners right and left and right and left has he hit the barrier there or has the car just stopped but there are a couple of marshal posts displaying yellow flags and that's going to rather scupper everybody else that is either due to go through that uh, area for the first of their laps or indeed the start of the second lap for everyone so does that mean that pole position is automatically going to be decided on this first run for everybody and therefore Sheldon van der Linde is in the perfect position to get into the top four I'm sure the risk control will be right on that and be if the car has hit the barrier or has been uh, it's certainly come to a halt, but they'll be trying to think about how to recover that car very, very sharply so that they don't destroy what will be a second run for these drivers. Well, it'll be, ironically enough, the sister car at True Racing that will be the first car through that area because now Tim Heinemann is heading through Hohenrein and over the grid hatchings to complete the lap. It's an 813.095, so that is faster than any of the SP9s have been all week. And to give you an idea, probably, of how low we're going to be dropping for the next car through, it's an 812.883 for Jesse Krohn. He was able to go purple on one of the speed traps, got up to 206 kilometres per hour through sector five, the middle of the nine sectors. Uh, but uh, intriguingly, Tim Heinemann, faster than Krohn in that final run to the line. So clearly straight line speed in the KTM is very, very good, as we've noted on the Grand Prix circuit. Over the line next is Charles Espenlau, and Espenlau's time for the CP Racing Mercedes is an 8.27.361. Now just slotting between Heinemann and Espenlau is Earl Bamba in the number 18 KCMG Porsche, and to second fastest, Dries Van Tor. And as I mentioned, Dries was off in as the, the sixth-placed car, rather seventh-placed car, and came through sixth. So he's got ahead of Pierre Kaffer somewhere around the lap and has gone second fastest in Dries's number 15 Audi at 813.059. Expecting Mathieu Jaminet across the line very shortly. And I just think I heard the rumble of the 6.2 litre V8 of Patrick Assenheimer in the Landgraf Mercedes as well. They are all in the final sector. As Mathieu Jaminet clips the curb at Hohenrein over the slight rise there. That hairpin on the Grand Prix circuit has recently been resurfaced, I've just noticed. And over the line will go Jaminet to the top. 8.12.672 after his first run. And still big question marks as to how hard everyone can push when they get to Hatsenbach well, because I've those yellow flags are still in. Car through on the tracker, which causes the 116 
uh, true racing and they have to slow down to the 120 kilometer limit yeah. at that point and that and then i think it's actually gone to uh, a waved purple area so i think it's even slower so they are all easing back during that sector it's gone to and 60. It's cost them at least a second the second half and that probably means as you said john this is the lap unless they can, they can clear this before the last these cars come around for their second run so it's it's all about sheldon van der linde here who's set five purple sectors so far he's green in sector six and seven as well and a clear road in front of him 745 we're up to and the run to the line will take about 25 seconds can he get beneath the magic eight minutes and 10 seconds to be honest at the moment that's not a priority as long as joe you're in the top four absolutely i'm, I'm intrigued I'm, I'm really excited to see this rover bmw into the tier garden now he will then go through the left hander flat out now up through the gearbox and across the line he's got five six sectors in purple showing up what will be the time then as he crosses the line and as we suspected eight minutes eleven point zero three nine and that car's gone to the and it's top of the timing it's going to be this lap because you look at the people who've gone through that slow zone you've got 111 118 and um, van leading at 102 through that uh, sector three where the uh, problem is the ktm's on a tow road and i'm trying to work out how much damage is there for ferdinand stuck but at least the car's no longer on the racetrack but the yellows are still out and i think the speed limit's still going to be in place for a little while as well yeah. Are they going to be happy with just pushing the car towards the barrier and, and away sort of as far as they can from trackside? Um, they've removed the slow zone, so this, they are happier with that. So well, where is van der Linde now? So van der Linde... In 98, I don't think he's going to be anywhere close to that incident yet. He'll be on the Grand Prix circuit yeah, still. Yeah, still on the Grand Prix circuit. Yeah, so he's going to get a second run. And Jaminet has gone through sector two, but we want the sector three time just to give us an idea of how much he has been delayed. Uh, David Pittard, well, actually, oh, what Aston Ima has just gone through not delayed by much. He's done a 104, so he's at most, that's within the, the range. It looks like everyone yeah. Aston onwards is going to be unaffected. Yep, Jaminet's done a 103, 5, which is absolutely on pace. So it's, it, it's, it's about the first seven got um, caught by that uh, slow zone. The last five or six are going to second lap. Don't forget, of course, it's not actually, the key point is not being first here. It's being in the top four. Mm. That's your bump ups. Those are the guys who go forward to qualifying too, which is currently Van der Linde with Rover, Rover Racing, Jamine with Top Sport WRT, Matteo Caroli with Dynamic Motorsport, and Jesse Corrin. So it's, it's the people like uh, uh, Van Tour and Heinemann with Audi and the crew racing, whether they got caught, whether they can get a chance to improve, because otherwise those top four are happily through. But Jesse Crone is right on the bubble, and his third sector was awful. Yeah, he's because he caught, he's, 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 he's gone, so he hasn't got a second lap, so he's, he's a sitting duck. So, was Lo ha were either Lawrence Van Thor or the true racing, uh, well, I mean, we know that Heinemann is caught, so either Lawrence Van Thor or Patrick Pile, were mm. they the other side? Of Pile the, of, the, of the actual damage. Uh, sorry, the slow zone. Well, Pile hasn't produced a, th a third sector time yet, so he'll be fine, I think, too. David Pittard, likewise, he was further back. Pittard mm. was off as uh, and the Mar penultimate and car. Angle as well, which I think is, 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 is yeah. must have a chance of, of making. So there's three or four people who can steal that fourth place. Uh, Van Tor, no, he got a 109 in sector three, so he was slightly caught by that. So it's very much um, the chance is Patrick Pile. Um, Pitar and uh, and Mara Engel, those two, those cars, the um, the Falcon Motorsports, TS Sports, Mercedes AMG, gets me. They will at least get two goes at it. But uh, as you say, people like David Pitar, who's currently eight, his time eight, eight, eight minutes thirteen one. He's now got a second run, and the cars just ahead of him, just ahead of him, stifling his move into the top four. Are the cars that were slowed and stifled with regards to that slow zone? So there's every chance that we're going to see the TF Aston Martin moving up and potentially qualifying for qualifying for the second session. And Maro Engel would be one of the big favourites before this session got started to get into the top four. He's ninth, so a lot of time to find, but Engel is only just going through sector three now. So that's the hats and back uh, area, uh, Flugplatz, and the run towards Schwedenkreutz and Arenberg. Though the top four as things stand, Rover Racing BMW number 98, Sheldon van der Linde, the 27 Top Sport WRT Porsche for Mathieu Jaminet, Matteo Cairoli in the Dynamic Motorsport Porsche number 28, and Jesse Krohn, very susceptible to being overtaken in fourth position because of that Duff third sector. Nothing to do with him. They were clearing up a KTM 
and on the hats and back. And he's just going to have to complete the lap for Schubert and hope that his qualifying time, though, out of the top four is still OK regarding his position in start group one. Ricardo Feller is pushing like crazy on the early part of the lap. So right-hander at Flugplatz. Uh, this is... No, this is further around the lap, beg your pardon. And the run now up the hill towards the carousel, in fact, for uh, car number... Ricardo Fella running in number five for Phoenix. Oh, and he's straddling the concrete there. That's what you were talking about. The car wanting to drift wide all the time, Mick. Yeah, that, that will loss of at least half a second. It, it's, it's a horrible feeling that pulls away from you. It's, it's the different grip level that you get yeah. from the concrete to the tarmac. And it, the, as we saw there, the car spat out of the carousel. That's going to cost him time. We'll keep an eye on that sector time and just see how much time being spat out of the carousel will cost a car. Mathieu Jaminet has just gone quicker than anybody else through sector six. That is one of the shorter sections, though. 35.2 is an indication of how hard the Frenchman's pushing already clinging on to second fastest in this session. 1.6 is the deficit between Jaminet's effort first time around and Sheldon van der Linde in the Rover Racing BMW. But I fancy Sheldon's time, if not good enough already, could be improved upon. He's not gone green, though, through any of the first six sectors. So that, again, might be an idea of the how um, the, the peak performance of the tyre's gone already. I feel like if, if I was his team manager, he's phoning up saying, that's fine, don't worry. Yeah, you're, not, you're in. It's top four. We're not bothered about it. Let's ease it back. Let's not push anything. Get it home safely. Not a problem. Well, 35.7 might be an idea that he's already done that because that's half a second slower than Mathieu Jaminet. But those that will be pushing will be Dries Van Tour in the number 15 Audi. The car entered uh, number 15 entered by Team Phoenix again. You've got uh, Patrick Pile who went green through the first couple of sectors. So a car best on the Grand Prix circuit, but he hasn't really found much pace since then, since hitting the Nordschleifer. And David Pittard could be a threat as well, going green in a number of sectors in the TF Sport Aston Joe. I think that Van Tour has lost this lap now. He was six seconds behind. And that, that slow zone at the Hatton back has cost him six seconds on the quickest times through that sector three. And it, there is nowhere on, the, on this track uh, the rest, albeit a very long track, you're going to make up six seconds, not no. on the cars and the way that these cars perform. We've got Ricardo Feller, it looks like he's got a chance to move up. He was only eight tenths off a bump up and he's already uh, greened as such. He's hit the car's fastest um, sector in seven of the, sorry, eight of the nine, sorry, seven of the nine sectors. Sorry, six of the eight sectors he's done with one to go. He's gone fast in the car. He's timed it at 1.8 off, which would be enough. It'd be a 12.9 right on the cusp, actually, with Jesse Cron. It was a 12.9 we put him a tenth out, so it's fellow who's right on the, the, the bubble at the moment. Jaminet's yep. already in if he crossed the line for the second time. So Jaminet over the line, and it's an 8, 14.0, so... Big one, fella. Second and a half oh, off. No, lost it in the last couple of sectors, he's slightly quicker, dropped a seventh overall. But fella was an improvement from lap one to lap two, so 8, 13.096, but that ain't going to be a top four. Now, what about Maro Engel? who is improving and finding time. It'll be better than 10th, I'm sure, by the end of the lap, but he's got to be an 8.12.883, which is Jesse Crone's time. Yes, he has done his requisite two laps now. Maro Engels at Brunchen, turning right there and heading for the ice curver. David Pittard is in the long sector seven currently, where if you mean business, you've got to be doing a 2.26, there or thereabouts. And it's a, well, for Pile, it's a 2.29. So he's been quite severely delayed there. Mm. Patrick Pile in the 33 car, currently eighth, looking to try and improve on an 8.13 flat and trying to get, well, he really only needs two tenths of a second to leapfrog Jesse Crone and bag that final place up for grabs. Fourth position in this session means you go through to Q2. Keep an eye on the Aston Martin, though. David Pittard in the TF Sport car. He's been quicker than the cars ahead of him through all the sectors. He's into the final sector now, so he should be with us very, very shortly. I'm talking about the number 90. Yeah, Pittard only Aston Martin. Fine, about four tenths to go past uh, Jesse Cronin currently in four. So with all those green sectors, and this is Hellaby, this is dropped one somewhere, it's looking quite good. Coming out the tier garden now, crossing the line. 
what was that final sector and he hasn't moved up the order 8.13 in 8.18 that time 8.13.4 yeah three tenths down from his previous lap oh, so 18.4 yeah something went wrong one. so where did he lose that time if we can work it out they were generally all improvements possibly sector five which wasn't green because he looked very healthy on the Grand Prix circuit as well. Mauro Engel is slowing for Tiergarten and Hohenrein. This is the final car that was waved off in Q1. And Mauro Engel, can he get into fourth position at the death? Well, he said an absolute best at 2.25, and he goes fourth, the second fastest, rather, to second fastest, and that will push Jesse Krohn out of fourth, down to fifth. And at the death of the session, Mauro Engel buys himself another couple of laps in Q2, an 8.12.376, Joe Bradley. Absolutely outstanding. Mauro Engel, there's a, as I've said, Johnny, there's a reason why you, you, you would plug a driver like Mauro Engel in. Just look at, the, just look at that timing screen. Sheldon van der Linde, Mauro Engel, Matthew Jaminer, Caroli, Krohn, Van Tour. There's a reason why these drivers were picked for this qualifying session. That man really did perform there. And I'm, I'm amazed that he just missed out ever so slightly. 8-12-3 uh, in comparison to the fastest time from the van der Linde BMW car number, car number 98 was an 811039. That was an outstanding lap from van der Linde. Yeah, in and many ways, Jesse Crone can feel a little bit disappointed he didn't get a charge for second lap. Yeah, the second lap yeah. taken away with Engel starting last, which you often think the most dangerous place to start for other people falling off the track. Played in his hands, they actually cleared the, tr the, the trouble in sector three and he was able to get through fast. The top five or six cars only got one lap. And Van Tour as well. Van Tour was disadvantaged with that, uh, that problem at the hats and back. So we perhaps haven't seen the full potential from them just outside of the top four so that that's their deal over i'm afraid yes so it'll be a 21st place start for schubert motorsport that now confirmed in the number 20 car you do not want to be fifth or slower in this session but those that will progress the 98 rover racing bmw thanks to sheldon van der linde who set a very swift time at his first attempt that means that both of the rover racing bmws will feature in qualifying two in a very short time indeed then Maro Engel who couldn't have left it later to snatch second place and ultimately that fourth spot up for grabs with an 8 12.376 27 was uh, the top sport WRT car of of Mathieu Jaminet and that means that we're going to see a different driver at the wheel of the 27 car in the form of Julian Andlauer in due course and the 28 Porsche of Dynamic Motorsport. So a BMW, a Mercedes and two Porsches move on into qualifying two. And now we need to allow time for those cars to circulate on the Grand Prix circuit, come back into pit lane to be met by their teams and yeah, re-prepped. By for scrutineering first. Well, uh, probably. Rolling, I can see them there. They're rolling into scrutineering there. The Marengo with the bright pink and blue uh, magnesium water-sponsored car. Um, that's rolling into uh, scrutineering right now. I'm sure it'll be a very basic check just for minimum weight and that sort of stuff. And then push, it, push the and, and check that the tyres are legal, obviously. That's sort of yeah. special formulation. And that'll go then back through the back of the paddock into the uh, its pit lane. How close was Sheldon van der Linde coming out of Sabina Schmidt's curve there and onto the hats and back, virtually brushing that Armco barrier, which is a bridge over one of the internal roads here, many of them at the Nürburgring. But you you have to push that hard to ensure you get a good time to get one to be 1.3 seconds quicker than anyone else. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the margin of error, and that's what I mean about the pressure, the intensity of these of this qualifying session where you've got to just we talk about optimizing the car setup and performance you've got the car set up exactly where you want it you've got the aero balance right but then we kind of take for granted the human element there's a human being in there pushing those pedals and turning that steering wheel and getting those gears at just the right moments and optimizing that run and let's not take that for granted shall we that's you know these guys are very very talented race drivers yeah, it's interesting because it is a big gap from first to second. So you wonder whether the, he slightly he slightly angled the risk and reward too much towards reward at that point. It'd be one point three seconds everything else. But you, would, um, yeah, you, you could say that in hindsight, Nick. Yeah. But, oh, why did you go so quickly? Yeah, stop it. You know, slower. You, you know. But, why, why did you? You, don't, you didn't have to chance. No, I mean, you know, outstanding performance and, and the time. The time came to him. Yeah. So we know because the draws already taken place for qualifying two where those four cars 
are now going to fit in because position three uh, is going to be the third car off, which will be the 27 Toxport WRT car, qualified initially by Mathieu Jaminet, but it'll be taken over by Julian Anlauer. The round of applause you can hear in the background, by the way, is for South African Sheldon van der Linde, who has just arrived back with Rover Racing, and he did the business for BMW, which will ensure that Nicky Katzberg gets a chance to be involved in qualifying too. And remember, Nicky Katzberg, up until this this point had been the fastest driver all week with an 8.14.771 rather putting that in the shade Sheldon van der Linde but I realized that car was on very very low fuel and virtually a clear road in front but it means an awful lot to Rover Racing to get their second car into the second qualifying session and they're within a chance definitely because of the M4's pace this week of locking out the front row positions. Wouldn't that be a story to see the 98 and the 99, regardless of which order, uh, in those top two spots? But there are three other major German manufacturers out to stop them. And as we continue the build-up to qualifying two, we're having a little bit of a shake around in our commentary box as well. A great thanks to Joe Bradley and Nick Damon, who we'll be hearing from much more tomorrow and Sunday during the 50th running of the 24 hours of the Nürburgring. Uh, but uh, so they bail out of their cars, if you like, and new pilots in Ben Constantin and Peter Snowden. Well, that was exciting enough, Ben. We're going to do it all again now with theoretically even quicker cars. One interesting observation that we saw from that previous session was uh, those last three cars that we saw over the line, they were interrupted by the yellow flag uh, at the start of the lap. The KTM was ahead of them. So Pittard, uh, Pile and Engel were not able to do fast laps on their first laps because they had to be slow through the yellow flag. Gotcha. Engel was over a second slower than perhaps he could have been on that first lap. And because it was so tight uh, at the head of the field, that was enough to put him eighth, ninth after that first lap. But obviously he had the pace to be able to improve on the second lap. Yeah, and you've always got to remember that, that one incident on the track is going to affect the next cars through but those that were waved away at the back of a 20 car field are no doubt going to catch the sort of start of that incident for Ferdinand Stuck so their first lap affected they were therefore much faster the second time around and uh, yeah you're right to point that out because we were getting very excited about those cars that were going to be the next ones through at hats and back and unfortunately Jesse Crone took the headlines for uh, his third sector being heavily delayed and there wasn't a great deal he could have done about that because it was a code 60 in place you can't go quicker than 60 kilometers per hour through the affected area and he did absolutely the right thing in backing things off so snowy um a reset as far as the track is concerned might even give some of the marshals a, a chance to, to sweep and make conditions even better um there is an awful lot of luck of the draw about this session. You know, the cars have been plucked out at random. Maro Engel, by the way, getting the handshakes, the high fives because of his very late work. His car picked out as the last one off, but I had, I had a feeling we were going to get something a bit special from the Munich Maestro. Uh, exactly so, Johnny. Um, you know, that which Ben just said, absolutely right. The, the car stuck there, stranded to get a second, but it's a code 60. It can't be helped, the luck of the draw, and just unfortunate. It is frustrating. It's as frustrating as it's possible to be frustrated uh, in this, because it's qualifying. But there's always the other side that it's, it's the top ten. That's what you need to be in. That's where TF Sport are. We spoke to Tom Perrier uh, during the lunch break, and he said, you know, if we're in the top ten, that's ideal, because, as you said yesterday, Johnny, you... I, I suggested that you don't need to be that high up at the front of a grid in a 24-hour race. Yes, but you do, but you want to keep out of trouble. Exactly. The two things of, of endurance racing, stay out of the pit, stay out of trouble. If you get into the midfield, you get into all sorts of other people's classes, speed differentials. You want to be with your peer group. So that, that's OK for them. But um, uh, interesting for there, I, I thought, we've seen this in NLS this year, uh, Johnny, with the, the BMW, the new, the new M4 uh, GT3 car, it's it's been the class act. It's been the car to have. With three different teams proving how good that car is, the BMW Junior team, Rover Racing, Vulcan Horse Motorsport, three different teams, always got different ways of running a car, but the same product, 
it's obviously it's there one two three one two three a lot of the time one two three five or something whatever but is this going to be the weekend where it changes it's 24 hour it's mm -hmm. totally different we're now seeing it's still one at the top at the moment but we're seeing other cars knocking on the door there, chipping away. I also predict, I'm going to risk it here now. I heard that sharp and take a breath there, Johnny. Uh, I, I thought earlier on it's a little bit cooler now. Um, I would not be surprised if we see eight tens. Yeah. Uh, in this, I think it was 808 last year. 808. Eight oh eight. Yeah. Well, Farfus did an 808 in the, in yeah. the qualifying weekend, I think, for top qualifying think, for that. But also how close it is at the top, Johnny. We're talking two, 2.3 seconds across the top ten. Yeah, it's, it's like it's like a one make formula, and it's not. We've got how many different brands in there, different ideas to set up, different teams on the Nord slide for over so many more opportunities over 25 kilometers to make different errors, mistakes, and whatever. But you're still 2.3, so 1.3 seconds across. Uh, so yes, 2.3 seconds across 10 cars just goes to show the level of prep and professionalism in all these teams. One of the fascinating things, as you were talking, I was listening, but I was also form filling because there's quite a lot of admin that you have to do here to work out where the top four cars will slot into the new qualifying order. The way they've come out of the hat is the first car to be waved off in qualifying two will be the 101 Valken Horse Motorsport BMW M4 of Christian Krognes. Now, the qualifiers, um, 27 had just been qualified by Mathieu Jaminet. You can't use the same driver in each of the sessions, so it'll be Julian Anlauer second time out and he'll start as the third car to be waved off Jules Gounon will take over the Mercedes number four that Maro Engels just exited he'll start fourth then you've got Thomas Prining in the 28 Porsche to start from eighth but the really interesting thing for me is the way they've qualified the two Rover racing BMWs will be waved off together effectively 10 seconds apart but they'll be 11th and 12th now are we going to see a bit of sneaky first car just backs off a little bit to allow a toe down the dotting of Hoor to the flag and then they can repay the favour next time around one word teamwork I mean that is a bit of luck I would say that they have found one another in the middle order right in the middle 11th and 12th with already designated driver Augusto Farfus in the 99 and Nicky Katzberg to take over the 98. The theory is fantastic isn't it and we see it so much in those slightly lower powered touring car races for instance but there are so many corners there are so many kilometers on this circuit for the driver ahead to make a mistake a little mistake will cost both cars a lap and when you've only got two laps to do it in is it really worth the risk all right, around the dotting of it's great. You can just sit there flat out. But there are too many corners to really, for me, take that risk to do so. Even if Farfus and Katzberg are absolutely mega drivers. You'd need one to compromise one of their two laps in order to pay a favour to the other. How many I corners is there? 140, 150, 150? I think it goes up one every, to every year I keep yeah, coming back exactly. here. But there's too much. Right. I mean, I was, that was mainly in jest. There's way too much to lose yeah. if you try and mess about with the formula. Uh, but nevertheless, it's going to be interesting because they, they've, I'm sure that's entered uh, Rover Racing's mind purely about not tripping over one another as they start nose to tail for this second session, which is, by the way, just over seven minutes away, Ben. Of course, if you ask Katzberg and Farfus if they were able to do it, they would say, yeah, we would never make a mistake. Yeah, naturally. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to happen. But that's what, a, that's what a team manager has got to uh, uh, process and organise mm -hmm. and manage. Quite literally, team manager is the drivers will want to do that. Now, obviously, the worst thing, the flip side of that is, of course, Johnny Ben, that the worst thing you want to do is trip over your teammate and in, in that moment of not madness, but in that moment of wanting to do a little bit better, drivers want to telling a racing driver to go slowly doesn't very really happen very often. Yeah. I'm now thinking the downsides of all of this <laughs> exactly. because if in the previous, if as like the previous session, you get a car off. They're both on the same bit of track together, yeah. so you're both going to get you're going to get the compromise at the same time, and there's no way really of separating them. I've talked myself massively out of that <laughs> argument now, and I, I would prefer to have one car at the front and one car at the back of the 20. I've said it for a long time, Johnny, that you would make a great politician because you, you can explain <laughs> both sides of the stories eloquently and believably. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, well, you go, you go whiche <laughs> with whichever argument I've just presented, and uh, I will win either way. I'm going to go with the b body language expert in this 
team of commentators. Just watching Mauro Engel there talking to Jules Gounon back in the pit uh, garages. And, and Eng Engel didn't look very happy. He wasn't the kind of a man who's just achieved something great. He looked like he struggled a little bit with the car. He was describing how the car was oversteering a little bit, had a bit of a snap at one point. I was taking this all from his conversation we couldn't hear, but just see. Uh, yeah. But certainly didn't look like a man who just achieved something great. Um, and so uh, I think maybe they're still chasing something in that Mercedes. About five and a half minutes away from the session and the crowds are back again in force in 2022. We have really missed them over the last couple of years for obvious reasons, but that pumping dance music and if you get even deeper into the forest, it turns into thrash metal. When you move from one area of the campsite into the other, there's kind of no fade between that music. It's just like a wall of sound that hits you. And a lot of fans here, almost the fact that there's a racing event is secondary. They've come out with their mates during a century weekend it's a four-day weekend here in Germany and uh, they've clearly have this booked off work uh, for probably a year or more but isn't it fabulous to have particularly at the Mercedes arena you know the grandstand stack full of uh, fans and it's also when you're driving around you think the drivers have got these emotions of driving the car etc but this you are aware of everything going on around you uh, and not only is it, it it sounds and stuff and you can hear bits of music and stuff going around but it's also some of the smells and things you get and people get barbecues going and there's bits where you know they've obviously eaten already because it's, it's <laughs> the smells gone so it's been cooked and gone there are there are other uh, senses that uh, are affected as you're driving around and it's quite extraordinary when you get out into the at night and you're thinking oh okay that's uh, that's interesting well, if you get a lot of um, barbecues, almost what feels like a mist descends, but it's just smoke, and you've well, got to be a brat mist. Yeah, I think it has to be, yes. <laughs> and and it's the ever-changing nature of the Eiffel Mountains, whether um, you know down to humans or down to the, the the natural weather changes we get here through the day. I mean, when we arrived here early this morning, there was that typical mist blowing, hang, uh, uh, hanging low, I should say, in the valley. Um, thankfully, conditions couldn't be a lot better this evening for qualifying. And the sun is going to get lower, although sunset not going to be until about half past nine tonight. So I don't think uh, blinding sunlight is going to be an issue. And this little breeze as well that we've got, it's not too strong, but there's en enough to clear anything that might be lingering. So if we do have yeah. the cold temperatures that we are forecast for on Sunday morning, as long as that breeze sticks around, it will blow the fog away. And of course, we've been heavily compromised by fog the last two years. We desperately do not want fog. We don't seem to have massively poor weather uh, forecast across the weekend. There's a possibility of a little bit of rain, and we found that we can come into the circuit this morning. It was drizzly and miserable and quite English, really. Uh, but uh, it has developed, as it does in the UK, into a beautiful evening. Well, we saw the classic race this morning, didn't we, with uh, more, more cars on the circuit than we got in this race. 187, I think it was. Really? In the classic race this morning, and it got to that, uh, that awful stage of a racetrack where it's not one or the other. Uh, it's that, that greasy in-between bit, which is the most lethal. Uh, and then you ran the Nordschleife as well. So, But I, I, think, I think you're right, Ben. I don't think rain's going to be an issue this race, as he touched wood, touching my head, hopefully. But uh, I think the fog early in the morning, that might, I think, predicted to come down to three degrees. Uh, okay. Early hours, sort of seven-ish dawn, around about then. So that's, that's the issue. Will it, will it bring the fog in? And is there going to be enough, you said, the wind to clear it? Yeah. Uh, it? There might be some fog. How long does it stay there? That's what we need to get rid of. Otherwise, we could be on potentially on for a, a record uh, lap-setting distance because it is not looking particularly wet conditions and therefore we should have... I mean, we are a lot... Uh, more aware of incidents these days than perhaps we were a few years back so we're more careful when it comes to removing cars off the track and and therefore yellow flag zones code 60 zones things like that so that might compromise the ability to go the longest distance ever but there's still a possibility in terms of the weather so we'll focus on the matter in hand because now uh the second drivers of those four that have now qualified for Q2 are being installed and those designated at the start of the day for the already qualified cars are getting ready for that as well. And I suppose there's an element of doubt in the mind of Julian Anlauer, Jules Gounon, Thomas Prining and Nicky Katzberg as to whether they would be taking part tonight, but you can very quickly switch the mind on. These are world-class GT3 drivers and unfortunately for Ferdinand Stuck, he didn't 
couldn't get much further than hats and back and the 117 true racing ktm is having to be craned away only now are the crews who are always very quick to the scene of the crime um having the chance to recover this vehicle so we might be a little bit uh, late off than planned due to be underway in just under a minute ben we are releasing the cars onto the grid of course to then that's release a very good point away. Yeah. so we are on the nordschleife where the the ktm has broken down so we can still get the cars onto the grid and hopefully by the time we've done that and all that uh tomfoolery that we had a little bit earlier on with the glickenhaus pausing uh, and it actually ending up not being able to set the lap time mm. uh, we can do that part of it and hopefully uh, the uh, ktm is off the circuit in one piece we should hasten to add so that is a technical issue rather than an issue that Stuckey had uh, in terms of driving that car expired going on to the Nordschleife and it's not too far away so they can get it back no, to the exactly. and get working on it ASAP because what else were they going to do with themselves this evening apart from repair it they weren't going to relax were they uh, we were talking about record distances I thought it was a fine time to bring in that actual record distance which was set in 2014 at 159 laps when Christopher Haza, Christian Mamaro, uh, Rene Rast and Marcus Winkelhock won for Phoenix. To put that into perspective, 159 the record, we were 100 laps short of that last yeah. year. 59 laps because it was less than 10 hours of actual running, let alone racing. You know, much of the running that took place was affected by Code 60 and by yellow flags. Uh, and that was the new shortest distance in 2021. But the last time we had clean running in 2019, we were only two laps shy of that. Mm -hmm. Two years before that, uh, because the 2018 race was red flag for two hours, we were only one lap short of it. So if we have a dry race all the way through, it doesn't, it, it's, it's very possible that we can go to the 160, the magic 160. And you think about the development that's taken place since that record year in 2014 to GT3 yeah, exactly. machines. You know, the lap time will have come down an awful lot, even on full tanks. So, yeah, the, the potential's there, folks. We're trying to build it up for you. And the fact that the weather conditions do look promising, if the low mist strikes, it's less about visibility for drivers and more about post-to-post -post visibility for the marshals because they need to be able to know which flags and which lights are being shown at any point. Ah. That KTM did not crash, gentlemen. No. Well, we knew it didn't crash. We had a technical, but that's quite an obvious technical, Snowy. Yeah, right rear tyre failure uh, completely. Well, it's not on. No, it's on. And I think it's a wheel, actually. I think you're yeah. right. The rims with his wife. I thought the I thought the tire of the laminated was coming out. You're absolutely right, Ben. And you, your eyes are younger than mine, you see, so oh, they're yes. better. Um, but yes, I just thought it was, thought it was a tire, but the wheel is completely off there. So as long as he was looking quite happy about loading the car up, wasn't he? So I, what's that telling me, a body language expert? I know you are, Ben. What it's <laughs> telling me is that he's not sitting there thinking, oh, this is over. Yeah, how much yeah. work they do? They, as long as it's only something like a hub failure, as in a hub nut or something, it's fine. I think the car has been lifted on better the at the hats and back than anywhere else. Well, Sorry. yes, exactly. The car's been lifted onto the flatbed with only three wheels on it. I think he's still got the fourth wheel down by his uh, his ankles. So that, here. <laughs> yeah, he'll be taking that back to the team and going, why is this separated to that bit of the car? And as Ferdinand was crawling along, sensibly staying off the racing line, David Pittard steaming past him because, I mean, he will have seen the odd yellow flag, but uh, he was not holding up because he needed clearly to get the pace through the hats and back, wanting not to be... Uh, ensconced into a code 60 if it happened around him so he, th he probably thought I need to get out of here quick smart there's and a, pass the stricken there's car there's a reason I gave him his nickname <laughs> Pitbull <laughs> Pitbull 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 <laughs> there's a reason yeah so unfortunately for David it was uh, it, it was really all on the second lap and uh, he wasn't able to make that top four so we're not going to see an Aston Martin in Q2 but we are going to see Audis Mercedes BMWs is there a Ferrari in there? There's a Lamborghini in there. The yep. Conrad Motorsport Lambo has made it in. And the Octane 126 Ferrari, together with Porsches, of course, as well. And a couple of those making it through from Q1. So cars getting their final bits of preparation, including the three and the four from Team Get Speed. The BWT-backed cars heading out onto track. I don't know what the confusion was between the three and the four. As I say, for a long time this weekend, it was the three that needed to get in and the four was already pre-qualified. But then when the official list came out, the cars were reversed. 
So anyway, Engel did the business and uh, the number four car is in to Q2. Now with Jules Gounon to qualify. And if you're interested, the number three car is going to be driven by Maximilian Gertz, sharing with, amongst others, Adam Christodoulou this weekend. Ooh, lollipop lifted for the number, what's that, the three? Yes, with yes. Fabian Schiller's name on the roof as well. And very quickly lowered again to avoid an unsafe release. Thankfully, contact was avoided there. And fans really up for this second phase of qualifying. There are going to be 20 cars released as they were in the previous session. Four of them carried over from one to the other. And we're not just tacking them onto the back. Actually, some decent starts up the order for all of the four cars that have progressed. Do some of these cars have that penalty looming over them? Because we've seen a lot of penalties handed out in qualifying, which dictate they must start at the back of their starting group. Some with a two-minute penalty. Some 20 cars, I think, in total. And uh, so whilst we might be showing the fastest cars in this top qualifying, they might not actually start the front of the grid. Yeah, well, the big one in all of that is actually last year's winner, yeah. Mantai Racing, because a tweet from Lawrence Vantel, we were chatting about this earlier in the broadcast, suggesting to us that Mantai will not be taking part in Q2 at all. And I am not seeing the Grello liveried, that's green and yellow, folks, the Grello liveried Porsche from Mantai. So they have thought we're going to have to start at the back of a 60-odd car field in Start Gruppo 1. Um, let's not risk the car and park it for Friday and join the grid. Well, they might uh, spend some time in warm-up tomorrow morning, but otherwise join the grid for a four o'clock start on Saturday afternoon. Car 101 is going to be started by Christian Krognes with the Yokohama Advans fitted and with the black and white uh, branding on one of three BMWs from Henry Valkenhorst's team or family Valkenhorst's team. And this is the pro car, the other two being pro-ams, Christian Krognes, uh, part of a, a lineup that won the Spa 24 hours just a couple of years ago. Norwegian driver to kick things off, therefore, and slotting in behind. We haven't got yet Nico Bastian for the Bilstein Mercedes crew in another pro-am car, but parking up in his rightful position is Julian Andlauer in the black of Top Sport WRT. And here, now, as mentioned, Nico Bastian arriving. He's the gold in this four-driver lineup, which also includes Hubert Haupt with the number two flashing. But BAS telling us that Bastian is on board as the elected driver for qualifying. So grid starting to take shape, gentlemen. And uh, for those fairly early on, on uh, parade, just a matter, to, uh, a matter of collecting your thoughts, maybe visualising those 170-odd corners, Ben. And without the distraction of a million fans around and various festivities at this grid uh, on Saturday afternoon will be absolutely rammed full of uh, another opportunity to marvel at the spectators and, and the way that the celebrations around this race uh, have continued and grown over the years uh, because we really will see uh, an incredible... I'm, I'm assuming it'll be open to the public, as it has been the last couple of years. I don't see why not. You sometimes have music on there. You yeah. certainly have grid girls brought in from the team as well as uh, from the organisers. Uh, and that will be such a special way to kick the event off. But a lot of drivers find it heavily distracting. Uh, they don't like all of, the, all of the fuss. And they were much happier to sit in a car with nobody on the grid uh, and focus, Snowy. Quite right. That's what you're here for. You're here. Here, here. It's your job. <laughs> well, there's often so many spectators. I mean, I have been down on the grid ahead of the start of the race in previous years, and you struggle to find the cars. Yes, exactly. You know, and if you want a, a late comfort break before getting on board, if you're doing the opening stint, where, where's my car parked? Where's the team? And you don't need that extra stress. However, uh, the seat. Uh, you could use the seat, but Not sitting, the race, sitting sure. still. On the grid? Come on, Snowy, you've been brought up better than that. <laughs> yeah, you, correctly so, but you haven't got time. Um, I just noticed, by the way, and uh, I'm sure many of our other eagle-eyed fans will have noticed that uh, the dynamic motorsport Porsches are on Pirelli's for this year's race. So majority of Porsches on Michelin's because in Carrera Cup championships, the two are married up. But uh, dynamic uh, Italian team. So maybe it's an obvious choice to go with Pirelli's for car 28 and car 29. Cairoli part of that team 
uh, that got the car through into this second session of qualifying. Obviously a winner last year, but uh, a winner in the number one machine, uh, so moving teams uh, for this year. Still, the mood of the crowd is being revved up ahead of the wave off for these cars and yeah ben's pointing out to me that the two get speed cars are together on the grid as yeah, well we, which about Rover. we did and that, that has completely passed me by but uh, because the number four car bagged second place late on they will start fourth and maxi gertz that's jules gunon in the first car maxi gertz right behind in the number three car so they're going to be nose to tail as well well let's see if the which strategy they employ <laughs> Got a couple of different teams to, to have different approaches. The uh, scars of a number of cars running wide down at the Yokohama S from a busy day of racing here at the Nürburgring Nordschleife. Cars of all sorts of different heritages, but uh, these are the most modern racing this weekend. And uh, in the case of the M4, a brand new in its first season GT3 machine. And is it the most most uh, numerous numerous in this session? Good I think question. It is. One, two, three, four, five BMWs. Mercedes will run that close. Five of the AMGs as okay. well. We've got, from an Audi perspective, I make it four. Porsches, one, two, three, four of those. 911 GT3R Generation Twos. There's the Lamborghini of Conrad Motorsport and there's the Ferrari in its bright gold wrap for 2022 from Octane 126. First car waved away. That's Christian Krognes, swiftly followed by Nico Bastian for Bilstein. Seems rather fair, branding-wise. Make sure everyone's covered. Equal opportunities for all. Well, I mean, it, yeah, balance of performance is so crucial in GT3, and, and it's a global category, of course, but... Uh, the stewards have to be so on point around here. The good thing is virtually every corner known to man is on this lap. So if a car's going to be good through the slow stuff, then another car should be good on the quick dotting a hoor. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's about how you make that time across 24 hours as well. So tricky to get it right. And all the variables in between, because, you know, the smallest incident, even just a KTM losing a wheel, as we saw in the first session, should that happen in the race, you'll be into a yellow flag zone followed by speed limits. But the yellow flag zones have always been, for me, a chance to catch up, sometimes a 10 second gap. Because if you've got a slower car, if you're behind, for instance, the Dacia Logan going into yellow flags, yes, you can't overtake it, but you can gain an awful lot of time. What are you saying about the Dacia? <laughs> <laughs> Only that it's not a GT3 car. I, I, love, I love the branding on the back of the Dacia. It says Dacia versus Goliath. It, uh, and yeah. that is spot on for me. <laughs> and fair play to all those involved in, the, in that initiative to get it back. I know it's done a few NLSs. We are missing the Opel Manta this year. Often, so many times, we've said that, that uh, an Nürburgring 24 hours cannot run officially, according to the regulations, without an Opel Manta <laughs> in the field. And they, they did try desperately to get it here, but uh, a hiccup, well, there was a fire, wasn't there? We did a lot of damage to that car in the run into this race so uh, hopefully in the near future that will come back again to the ring well it was due to be its last race wasn't it It was going to be retired in this race as in the the 50th running of it it was all the right things to do that and yeah uh, of course that fire damage it I'd, i've seen photographs of it and it's uh, i'm not saying it'll polish out but there was still a lot of color left on the car for it that way, as in it's a uh, an, an engine bay cockpit fire internally uh, so it's not burnt to a cinder um, but it's uh, It'd be great to see that come back and have it a last swan song. You could see the foxtail out again. Ben Tuck away in the second of the Vulcan Horse BMWs from 16th in the order. So that's car 102. Marek Bockman in the Schnitzel Arm Racing Mercedes AMG, number 34. Then we get to Jordan Pepper in the teal and black Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini with its 5.2 litre V10 sitting right behind Jordan's seat position. Nico Menzel in the Uber Motorsport 25. They've got a, an SP7 Porsche in the race as well, but this is the top-notch GT3R. And finally, Dennis Fetzer in the Pro-Am driver lineup for Lion Speed by Car Collection Motorsport, another Evo 2 R8 LMS. So the cars I missed, Julian Andlauer, as, as mentioned, started third and is already well into sector three. Jules Gounon setting off in the number four 
uh, Mercedes from Get Speed with his teammate Maxi Gertz behind. Lawrence Vantor not on the grid, remember, for Manti Racing. They were due to start sixth. Kuba Gamaziak for Shearer Sport Team Phoenix, elected as the qualifying driver for car 16. There's been a switch in the number 28 after Matteo Cairoli got that car into the session. Thomas Prining is the Q2 driver. Dan Harper for the BMW Junior Team, number 72. That's another Pro-Am entry with Neil Verhagen and Max Hesse joining Dan come the race. They started ninth in the lineup. Lucas Stoltz in another Bill Stein Mercedes AMG, number 12, is the full pro car. Uh, Augusto Farfus and Nicky Katzberg for Rover Racing and their two BMWs. Luca Ludwig driving the Octane 126 Ferrari for the Swiss team. Patrick Niederhauser is driving the 24 Car Collection Audi. He also has a teammate behind him, Christopher Haaser. So there are three separate teams that uh, a quirk of the draw has seen them come out of the hat nose to tail. Mathieu Jaminet already finding his way towards what looked like Metzgersfeld there. The run out of Adenauer forced. So Krognes furthest up the road. He's already well into sector five, which is one of the longer sectors on the track. These times, remember, don't matter. These are just outlaps, effectively. But the next time they head across the stripe, it will be business. And how hard do you push? Do you, give, do you leave something in reserve so that you've got tyre to lean on in the second lap? The absolute peak performance, bearing in mind this is a 25-kilometre circuit, will just start to go away, regardless of which tyres you've chosen for this event. I would say potentially not, in that you've got... You're absolutely right, John, that it's such a long way round to complete a lap here. You've done 25k on that tyre anyway, so it's fully grained up. Go for it on that first lap, because you might you might encounter traffic on the second run. If you haven't and you haven't achieved it and you get a good, you've got a, another bite at the cherry on that second run. But don't wait till that run. Yeah. Get, get it in there while you can. There's, there's very little in motorsport that permits you to wait, actually. Go for it whilst it's there. And if you can improve next time around, that's a bonus. It, it's a luxury, but of all places that, can, that, that those opportunities can be taken away, it's going to be here. So I'd, I'd get it in the bank. A couple of order changes uh, out on, on mm -hmm. circuit whilst we get ourselves into the warm-up. Of course, they can change the order in which they've been drawn. Uh, so the first car actually on track now is Nico Bastian in the uh, Bill Stein Mercedes ahead of the Vulcan Haas Christian Grognier's car. Uh, so uh, he is now leading the pack through. The other one on a real push is Jordan Pepper, who should have been uh, third last, but the Lamborghini has already passed the three cars ahead of him, which is the Schnitzelam uh, Mercedes, a Falcon Horse BMW, and Christopher Hasser in uh, the second of the Audi Sport team car collection, uh, Audis. So he's actually split those two team cars, uh, really on a push to try and get himself in a position where he's uh, potentially not held up uh, going into the fast lap, as has Nico Bastian. I was about to say that maybe the draw has been done to put the Pro-Am cars towards the rear of the field, but then I look at actually the second car to be waved off, which is the first of the two Bilsteins. That's a Pro-Am lineup, as is the BMW junior team. But uh, coincidentally, the last five cars to be sent away, Valkenhorst 102, Schnitzelarm 34, Conrad 7, Huber 25 and Lion Speed 23. They are all pro ams, but they've got the probably the well, they will have the pros in oh, to well, qualify. Exactly, and the cars it makes the no same. difference. Yeah, yeah. So they actually, you might find a pro am machine could, in theory, qualify at the head of the field, even yeah. though half the team is uh, is the am drivers. They're not represented in this particular session. Yeah. It's not like where you have to get all three drivers qualified and then do an aggregate of the times and yada, 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 like the old WEC days, which is very confusing. True. They would go on forever if we had to do that here. <laughs> very quick update on the Foxtel Manta just before we uh, finish these laps and get on to the timed laps, Johnny and Ben. But uh, uh, the, the plan for the Manta apparently was to graduate to the... 2023 version of the classic next year, i.e. this be a 24-hour <laughs> nice. race, but it's, it's prime sort of uh, outing graduate to the 23 Classic next year. Now, so what's going to happen is it's going to, to be rebuilt, apparently, to come out in this race next year Mega. and then do the Classic from 24 onwards. OK. I like that a lot. And I, I, I'd hoped that that might be the case. So, Bilstein, number uh, six Mercedes, Nico Bastian, who is the goal, 32-year-old German, uh, is now out front and will be the first car to pop back onto the Grand Prix circuit from Hohenrein. 
He's on the Dottinger Hoor now, running parallel with the street traffic. And again, weaving from left to right. We saw this for leading cars at the end of uh, Q1, at the end of their first lap of Q1. You know, there's every possible moment still to bolster that tyre performance, Snowy. Yeah, I was quite surprised just watching uh, the uh, Maximilian Goetz and the, the Get Speed Mercedes doing exactly the same, coming out of bag work on that fast run up towards uh, Caracciola um, Carousel. And he mm. was doing exactly the same. And I was surprised that far into a lap still to trying to get that heat into it. But they know what they're doing. We're sitting in yeah. a commentary box. Well, I suppose when you're on a straight, actually, the tyres are just going to start to cool down again. They're not being worked. Yes, they're at high speed, but you've just got to stress them a little bit in the closing stages. So Nico Bastian in car number six over the line to begin properly top qualifying two. This two-segment session of dual lap but uh, solo dual lap qualifying you've got the Nürburgring Nordschleife to yourself or at least Nico Bastian has one or two further back have dealt with some traffic already and the question is who are they likely to catch in the next couple of laps which might disrupt proceedings beautiful paint scheme again this has adorned Audis in the past Bastian sideways there, coming out of the right-hander and heading for the Dunlop Carer at the bottom of the hill. It's too early for the drifting, isn't it? <laughs> Giving it a go, though. Just nice, little, nice little bit opposite lot there. That will have got some heat into the sidewall. Certainly will, yeah. Um, and maybe a deliberate ploy to just uh, stress a little further on the Grand Prix lap, where there is potential runoff, should you need it. You don't want to try that. By the time you're getting to Schweden, Kreutz and Arenberg. But he's not leaving much on the table here, Ben. No, great first push uh, through the first sector. Not many cars, nice gaps between all these cars. So for the moment, the ones that have come across the line uh, don't look like they will catch or be compromised by the traffic ahead of them. Uh, but of course, Nico Bastian does, definitely doesn't have that worry. And, and I said when we were watching Q1, what a pleasure this must be to be in a GT3 car almost knowing that you'll never come across another car in the middle of the circuit, which is your fear throughout the rest of the weekend that there are slower cars around. You have to drive at 95% just in case there is the need to take avoiding action. But right now, there is nothing in the way of Bastian and the Nordschleife together in beautiful conditions, beautiful light. We don't have any rain on the track. He's got brand new tires and he can push as hard as he wants. All the boxes ticked, yeah. quite literally. And, uh, yeah, racing drivers dream of this moment. I think they do secretly like an incredibly busy lap around the Nordschleife as well and the challenge that that presents. The only one thing is he's going through areas of extreme light and then shade as well, which will take the eye a little bit to adjust because the trees are overhanging on several sections of hats and back. But if you've not become used to that over the last two days, you might as well go home now. Nico Bastian uh, just soaking this up and enjoying it as much as he can, at the same time keeping those concentration levels up to 100%. And not really. Oh, oh, I was just about to say, using so, yeah. every bit of the track available to him, but keeping it within the white lines. There, though, Snowy, he didn't. Well, he just missed, missed the apex on the right there and just ran a little bit there, but just just kicked up a little bit of dust there. That will have annoyed him. It won't have cost him anything more than probably a little bit of pride and just a little bit annoyed there if you want that perfect lap. But there's a there's 170 corners to get right in this lap. So uh, as long as he's up there on the times, two purple sectors set already so for Nico Bastian. So uh, looking like a good out lap or good, sorry, not out lap, good first time lap for him. Can you ever do a perfect lap of the Nordschleife? No, with of that many not. corners and that many kilometres? I'm not sure. I There's think most drivers will admit that the perfect lap is just imaginary. Uh, uh, it's interesting that all weekend on our timing screen we have got a column that reads theoretical best <laughs> when you join together all of the perfect oh. sector times for your car, but. <laughs> That, to me, that's just one of those things just slightly out of your grasp, Snowy. Yeah, just, just delete that column. It's never helpful. <laughs> Pointless. But it's useful for reference to know that, uh, you know, it is possible at least, uh, but there are a number of variables before you get there. But that's what team managers use to beat you with a stick. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. yeah great ammunition um, I was about to give the octane 126 Ferrari a bit of love because in the first half of the Grand Prix track the octane 126 488 had been the fastest car out there but that's been improved upon again by a car outside of the top uh, 10 so who's gone even faster it's Jordan Pepper in another non-German car, the Conrad Motorsport Lamborghini. You and I, Snowy, have had some conversations about the likelihood of 
well, not necessarily a winner on Sunday, but a pole sitter that isn't from one of the four major German marks. And I have to say, the early pace of both the Ferrari and the Lamborghini is encouraging. Yeah, I mean, that, that Lamborghini, it's, uh, and certainly the Jordan Pepper aboard, it, it's never lacked pace. That's never been an issue. It's just lacked luck. That's yeah. always been its problem, and, and reliability, unfortunately. But some silly things. I mean, uh, we've had it's had a, a puncture once a It's had a wheel bearing failure in an NLS round. I mean, when does that happen? It just it's just unheard of, and just silly things like that. Uh, and pace is there. It just it just needs to. It might be one of those one of those cars though that can't do a four hour NLS race, and might just surprise us in a 24 hour race. <laughs> Such as the field spread uh, of our field after that single lap, we see about four and a half minutes between uh, our first car, which is uh, Nico Bastian, and our last car, which is the Lion Speed by Car Collection, uh, which came over the line about 45 seconds ago. So nearly four minutes between the first and the last car. Uh, all just trying to find their feet. There was no need to push on that uh, opening lap because it wasn't a timed lap. They started from a stationary position, uh, but uh, that is how long it will take to fully establish who is our fastest man. And of course, it's also going to stretch a little bit as we do these two laps. Yeah, and uh, decision to be made perhaps for Jordan Pepper as to if he can get close enough to Marek Bockman and Ben Tuck ahead of him to get by, if he's at ahead. all possible. He is already ahead. Yeah. Well, I wondered that uh, because, as I say, he's in amongst Pro-Am cars there, but Jordan Pepper, gold-rated from South Africa and joining uh, Axel Jeffries, Michele Martino and the fourth driver in that uh, Lamborghini has changed quite recently actually it's now going to be Maximilian Hacklander brought in to make that a four driver lineup rather than the three that it was originally labeled as on the roof of the Lambo Franz Conrad's team just as this unfolds in front of us boys the um, uh, We've talked about eight tens when I get down to this. Uh, the, the lap record on this configuration is uh, Augustus Farfus yep. in an 808. I think it's a 421, 808. Yeah. Uh, he was out on track at the moment. Who's who's setting quick sector times? Is it Augusto Farfus? It chance? might just be. Yeah, in the 99 Rover Racing BMW. So 99 and 98 uh, left the main straight virtually together 10 seconds apart but uh, otherwise no cars between them and yes you're right that he's pushing incredibly hard through those sessions those sectors that mean a great deal uh, i.e hats and back flugplatz schwedenkreutz then there's a, a sort of 10 second um, sector time but the 145 is decent which is sector five and sector seven so crucial because if you can get through that in about two minutes and 25 seconds, it's always a long, long wait for the cars to reappear on our screen at the end of Sector 7. But that can be so pivotal uh, for the run onto Dottinger Hoor. So Nick Bastian still the leading car, if you like. Christian Krognes, the second car that you will see around the track. Mathieu Jaminet didn't know he was going to be in this session at the start of the day. But uh, his teammates uh, rather um, were labelled the Jaminate. That should be uh, Julian Andlauer, in fact, for this session. And Andlauer taking over for Q2 is up to seven minutes. So he'll be home in the next minute and 20 seconds or thereabouts. There'll be Bastian first across the line. 2.25 is bang on the money for me through sector seven. That was set by Christian Krognes. Bastien's time just uh, three tenths off that, and he's done the first bit of the Dottinger Hoor in under 20 and a half seconds. Down through the gears for the Mercedes, exiting Hohenrein now, and the first of two Bilstein liveried Mercedes in this session will cross the line over the eight minute 10 marker. It's an 8.12.326 for Nico Bastien, and that's a very decent marker to be laying down, at least for your first effort, Ben. Yeah, watch out for Thomas Prining uh, in the Dynamic Motorsport Porsche. He's had some purple sectors, good purple sectors, as we mentioned, in the middle of the lap for Augusto Farfus. Jordan Pepper uh, has some nice clear track ahead of him, so he's been able to be on pace as well. Uh, and uh, even in sectors five, we're still seeing the Ferrari setting purples, so lots of pace. And I think it's so close in this session that until they get across the line, we're not going to know uh, what kind of pace they're at. Well, Matthew Gemini, uh, 1.5 back and forth right now, the cars that have uh, set a lap time. Christian Crohn's just on the Vulcan Horse BMW, just gone 8.11.8. Top the time sheets now. 
He's now just been beaten by uh, Kuka Maziak. Yes. The Audi R8 with a 8 11.6 coming thick and fast now. Yeah, which is uh, one of the two Phoenix cars in this session. So Kuba, 31-year-old uh, from Poland, uh, a Meister when it came to the Porsche Super Cup. Uh, but has uh, gravitated to Audi in more recent years and an 811.670 then for the pole to dispatch Christian Krognes from provisional pole position but there's only 0.175 of a second between those two the Audi from the BMW then the first Mercedes which is Luca Stoltz in the number 12 offering from Bilstein so got Bilstein Mercedes uh, that were or that oh, are wow. Uh, fourth and fifth gents junior team bmw up to provisional yes. pole a 10.6 but we're still waiting uh, for the ferrari to get to us luca ludwig uh, should be on pace uh, as augusto farfus goes fastest by uh, nine tenths of a second so farfus ahead uh, of harper but now ludwig does get the pole position Luca Ludwig, I told you about the Octane 126 Ferrari being pretty nifty on the Grand Prix track. Well, on the Goodyear tyre for the Ferrari 488, provisional pole, it's an 8.09.469. So that's the first sub eight minutes, 10 second lap. And he has done that by, by a massive margin, 1.1 seconds, kind of unheard of. What we haven't yet had time for is Jordan Pepper's Lamborghini, who conveniently appears on the screen in front of me. He's now on the Dottinger Hoor, having been quicker than anybody else through the first sector. That is only about 40 seconds, though. I'm intrigued to know how Jordan Pepper's got on in the longer sector, 2.26. There are cars that have gone about 1.3 seconds faster than that, so it might not be good enough to skip ahead of of Luca Ludwig, but there is a Ferrari potentially on pole position here with one more lap to do for virtually everyone in the session. Fourth place for Jordan Pepper, an 811.462, gained a lot of time on the Grand Prix track, as mentioned, and that run through Hatzenbach was very good as well. To be lower than a one minute three, you're really pushing. And it was in the technical uh, far sweepers around the back of the circuit, Whippermann and uh, uh, Flansgarten, places like that, where the Ferrari was particularly strong in sector seven and a little bit earlier on the lap in sector five, which is a little bit more of a flat out section. So good uh, top speed from the Ferrari. Uh, now, how many will push for another lap? How many have got the ability to go even faster again? Otherwise, that to discussion that you guys had at lunchtime may well come true because we have a non German branded machine on the front of the provisional grid. Uh, two Italian cars on the front two rows provisionally at the moment. Yeah. Which yeah. Is, uh, quite, quite extraordinary. But that, that time uh, for Luca Ludwig in the, in the Ferrari, as you say, 1.2 1 1 seconds ahead. Just that's extraordinary. So that, that new gold livery obviously really suiting that Octane 126. And the background to that apparently was because uh, Simon Triller had that big accident in the last uh, NLS round, which uh, ended up destroying that chassis. So it's a brand new car. And I went and went and asked them a couple of days ago why the colour change. They've always been traditionally dark, blue and red. And they said, new car, new chassis, new race. Why not? New Octane 126. Well, at this stage, it seems to be a good, good move with the Ferrari faster than an awful lot of other cars that will have been many people's favourites, including Augusto Farfus in the number 99 car. Now, he is capable, when conditions are right, of an 808 and a 0.4, I think we said it was, 0.441. So that is a further second quicker than Luca Ludwig, potentially. How much in reserve has the Brazilian got I wonder second fastest so far for the Rover Racing BMW all of the top eight where they are positioned at the moment are cars that we knew they were into Q2 at the start of the day the quickest of the cars that joined this session I reckon is the Bilstein car number six so far uh, yeah, with uh, Jules Gunon down in 13th position Katzberg is 12th so far, and Julian Andlauer, despite what the TV graphics are saying, it is Andlauer in the car rather than Mathieu Jaminet, and he managed a 14th place with an 8.13.3. And Andlauer is actually in a brand new chassis as well. We uh, heard from Toxport that they had been struggling with uh, their previous Porsche, so they brought a brand new car, and its first outing was qualifying one yesterday. That was their shakedown, in effect. Uh, got that car to a point that was much better 
than what they found in the previous uh, chassis. Mm. Uh, so solved the issue that they've been having in the previous NLS races by simply building a new car and getting themselves up now into, into a pace which is comparable. In fact, they are only second fastest Porsche out there. Johnny, you mentioned that the uh, the Octane Ferrari had uh, such a good run on that Grand Prix circuit, uh, which is obviously the smaller part. It carried it right through to the uh, the rest of the circuit as well, and took the rest of the lap as well, and took that uh, provisional pole position. But the man on the charge at the moment is Jordan Pepper in the Conrad Lamborghini. The first sector, I know it's only the first sector, but everybody there, nobody's dipped under 40 seconds. And f uh, yeah, 40.1 seconds, 40.2. But Jordan Pepper done a 39.8 in that first sector. And improved his splits in third yeah. and fourth sector as well. Fourth uh, it doesn't really count. It's only only 700 <laughs> meters. Don't worry about that one. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he's only not he's only slower in the second sector because if you remember, he did an incredibly fast uh, second sector of the lap on his first attempt. Yeah. Uh, so he's not being able to improve on that, uh, but he is so far improving well in the other sectors. You ready for it? All Italian front row. How about that? <laughs> But the 62.6 seconds through sector three is just about the best offering so far of those circulating at the sharp end. 62.7 for Luca Ludwig in the Ferrari that is heading now to the right hander on the approach to the carousel. So continuing up the hill with the trees closing in on driver's right. Important for Luca to get the run on from asphalt to concrete just bang on and i have to say the wheel tracks of that ferrari perfect over those giant concrete slabs slowing is it slowing i don't, don't think it is oh. still looking good heading up the hill chris Haza as well in his car collection audi number 22 he's a bit further back from luca ludwig now approaching the cacciola with on the dotting of her this is uh, last chance saloon if you like for nico bastian car number six Bastian with the second half of a lap, which looks to be better uh, than his previous attempts. You can see the green uh, sectors on uh, sectors four through to the end of the lap. So this might be an improvement uh, from 10th position. There are plenty of green sectors showing on the timing screens. Not so many purples. Jordan Pepper's uh, purple in sector one still showing. But Nico Bastian's second attempt from 10th position stays in 10th. So significant, those last couple of sectors of the lap. Yeah. Yeah, flag is out now, so this is one that really counts. That Jordan Pepper, once again, quickest in section, uh, sector six, a 35.1. A uh, couple of tenths up there, which is all important. Those, as you said, six, to six, seven, eight, and nine. That's really, really important to the end of this lap. So Jordan Pepper's got the Conrad Lamborghini hooked up for the moment. Over the line goes Christian Krognes, and that was not an improvement either, an 812.975, so car 101 will start seventh or lower, because remember, there's always a chance for one or two slower cars on their first attempt to vault above. Jordan Pepper sitting in fourth, a Lamborghini on the ragged edge. Franz Conrad licking his lips here at the prospect of a front row start and maybe even a pole position. It's qualifying at the Nürburgring 24 hours. That's exactly what Jordan Pepper should be doing in the number seven, Conrad Lamborghini. And no wonder Franz Conrad is in there licking his lips going, that's my boy. Yeah, absolutely is. But he was a little wide Ooh. coming out of Brunchen and likewise didn't have a lot of road left on the right-hand side of Ice Curver onto the Dottinger Hoor. No chance of a toe for Luca Ludwig, but he didn't need it last time. And he's gone quicker than anybody else through Three the seconds. long sector on sector seven. Two, two minutes 24 in the sector seven for Luca Ludwig in the uh, number 26 Octane 126 Ferrari. An extraordinary run so far for these two Italian cars. They've been, they've just been sitting there in the background all this weekend. Is this going to be the? Is this their time to shine in the sun? Not many improvements on this uh, second lap for many of the cars coming across our line. We've just got uh, Rover coming across and no improvement from them. Uh, so uh, Farfus in second position, uh, the second Rover coming across the line, only 13th for Katzberg. And Katzberg uh, was 12th the first time around, so he's actually lost a spot because of some shuffling uh, above him. So qualifiers from one to the other, still the, bettest, the best car was Nico Bastian, car number six of the four that uh, lucked into this late on. Yeah, Ferrari didn't improve either, so a, an 8.10.4 uh, from Ludwig. But uh, just these two cars, Christopher Hasse and Jordan Pepper, looking like they may upset what has otherwise been relatively consistent from the guys ahead of them.
So Audi heading for Tiergarten and Hohenrein. Christopher Haaser, who is third fastest at the moment on an 811.210. And the car alongside him on the provisional starting grid also looking to improve. Jordan Pepper's just done a 225 through the long sector. What is Christopher Haaser going to do? He crosses the line and will stay in third position because he's three tenths of a second away from improving. Jordan Pepper oh. switches from one side of the grid to the other, fourth to third for the South African. Franz Conrad more than happy with that. He would have loved to have drawn alongside Luca Ludwig to make it an all-Italian front row. But in the end, it is a Ferrari from Octane 126 who have got pole position, perhaps against all odds, when you consider they were up against the might of BMW, Audi, Mercedes and Porsche. But Ferrari are on pole for the 2022 50th anniversary of the Nürburgring 24 hours, gents. Well, I, have to say, I didn't see that one coming. I really didn't. I'm, I'm so, so pleased that the, the Italian car just haven't figured. It's been a German stronghold at the German circuit. Why ever not? But it's just so, so good to see something different up there. Yeah. And that's going to make this race, it's going to make the first corner, uh, first lap fascinating. Uh, sorry, three, two Italian cars in the first three. Amazing. Still some cars to complete their session, but we're, in a sense, calling out Nico Menzel because he hasn't managed to improve on his own effort. And that is, yeah, backed up by the fact that he lost about seven seconds, all told. Some of that will have been knowing that he was down on time and therefore easing back. Dennis Fetzer as part of the Pro-Am lineup for Lion Speed by Car Collection about to cross the line as well. This should be an improvement, but a long way short of Luca Ludwig's effort and 8.09. There was one improvement late on uh, for Marek Bockman. Uh, okay. The Switzerland Mercedes getting himself up to 15th position uh, after sitting down in 18th. But in the background, you can hear the sound of Octane 126 celebrating. Their Ferrari, this team from Switzerland, will be starting from pole position at 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. It was Luca Ludwig, the 33-year-old German, who sets the time. Uh, and he will be joined during the race by Jonathan Hershey, Simon Trummer and Bjorn Grossman. And that change of livery, because of uh, a pretty horror accident for Simon Trummer not too long ago, has done the business, Snowy. It's a Ferrari that has always looked quick at times during the NLS season that will grab all the headlines tonight. It shows how much it can change in, a, in, a, in the blink of an eye, doesn't it? BMW M4 GT3 car has been the car uh, of the class act of the, of the series so far. It's been all this year. That's what the car does around here and the Nürburgring. I, I, honestly, we've got one on the front row, OK? Augustus Farfus. We've said he was the um, lap record holder on this configuration circuit anyway, so not really surprising. But uh, uh, a Ferrari BMW front row, Lamborghini Audi next, another Audi, and then it's BMW junior team and the Vulcan Horse car, Dan Harper and uh, Christian Krogners in the uh, Vulcan Horse motorsport car number uh, 101. 72 and 101 there uh, make up the, the, the third and fourth BMWs in that. Who would have thought they'd have been sixth and seventh in this in this setup? Mercedes, it is uh, Luke uh, Stoltz in the uh, number 12 car. And the Huber Motorsports, uh, Chris Menzel in the 911. And then the uh, Nico Bastian that rounds out the top 10 in the Mercedes, uh, get speed Mercedes. So uh, quite a, not, not a result I would have predicted. Uh, yes, it, I'm not surprised to see those two Italian cars in there. I thought they'd be most certainly in the top 15 without yep. question and quite probably in the top 10. Any higher than top five? No, because I thought it really was going to be BMW, Mercedes, but right at the front there, Ferrari. So the margin for pole position in the end, a clear second. 1.171 for Luca Ludwig in the Octane 126 Ferrari from the Rover Racing BMW that set an awful lot of uh, tails wagging during the qualifying weekend when Augusto Farfus was piloting it and he managed an 8.10.640. Not good enough for pole, but he'll start on the front row. Then Jordan Pepper left it late to switch from fourth to third, so the inside of row two in the Lamborghini from Conrad Motorsport, and then it was Christopher Haaser for Audi. So best Audi will start from fourth. The BMW I've mentioned, two Italian t cars in the top three. 
Mercedes, best one of those will be the Bilstein offering car number 12. The highest of the Porsches, Huber Motorsports example, number 25, to start from ninth position. And of those four cars that qualified late, the four that moved from Q1 into Q2, you're looking at 12th, 13th, 14th and 16th of the 16 cars. The punch of the air from Luca Ludwig climbing out of his car and about to be interviewed by a, a good number of press members. Patrick Simon is down there for local TV as well. But, uh, I mean, how much is that down to tyres as well? Because there aren't that many Goodyear shod machines in the race. Goodyear have brought plenty of tyres for cars lower down in the classes. But uh, from memory, Octane have always chosen the American rubber to run on. So they know that well. They know how it behaves during the race as well. And, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a marriage that's worked in single lap format, Peter Snowden. And you can't take anything away from uh, the, the DNA that Luca Ludwig's got. I mean, his father, well, yeah. Klaus Ludwig, it's, uh, it, it's, it's got to be there, hasn't it? And he's just proven it in that car. The car's brilliant, but he's a stunning, stunning lap. And as you spotted it, uh, Johnny, it started on the Grand Prix here, but carried it all the way through. Great job. And I'm now trying to remember the last time Luca Ludwig managed to do this because I'm pretty sure he's been, if not on pole, there or thereabouts. The BMW has um, flattered to deceive quite possibly on a Friday uh, to then not necessarily carry that form on into the race itself. But um, let's remind you of the top three for the 50th anniversary of the Nürburgring 24 hours. Jordan Pepper was fourth after a really good initial run. That's a pro-am car, but he bags third late in the piece. The hard work for Brazilian driver Augusto Farfas was done on his first effort because he's about four seconds off the second time through. An 8.10.640 for one of two Rover Racing BMWs that made that session. But it is the gold and orange of Octane 126 and gold rated Luca Ludwig, who plucked an 809.469 out of the session. And uh, that was done early on. He more or less matched it to, well, within a second of, uh, of his first effort next time around. So that's what's uh, giving me the impression that the Goodyear tyre wears well over a 25-kilometre period. And if you did take the second laps uh, individually from the first, he would still be the fastest. He'd still be there. He would still be on the pole. Uh, well, that shows you some consistency across two laps. What you have to be doing is do, do, <laughs> to do it over eight laps, which is a stint around here, roughly about an hour, and stay out of all the carnage that can be presented with 134 other cars on the circuit. And noticing that certain areas very much scattered with gravel, and possibly on the exit of Arenberg there, and certainly at the NKG chicane on the Grand Prix track as well. You don't really have a moment to adjust for that. You can't afford to just hope that running over that's not going to cause any dramas late on. But Luca Ludwig, as you say, he comes from great stock, but he's also competed in a number of these 24-hour races, so, so knows the drill now, Snowy. Uh, and he's put it all together, hasn't he? When it, when it matters for, for qualifying, it, it goes into the race tomorrow in the best possible position. Tomorrow, though, totally, totally different story. That was one lap. This is one day. Yeah. I think the year I'm remembering is 2020 when Luca managed to get a front row start. It actually wasn't pole position. He started alongside uh, the number four uh, Mercedes that year, which was the entry from HRT. So Krista Dulu. At Maro Engel, Lucas Stoltz, Manuel Metzger's car, and Luca Ludwig was in exactly the same driver lineup actually. So he had Hershey, he had Trumme, he had Grossman for teammates. Uh, was five seconds away though from that year's pole position time, and that will have been held in the wet as well because we were in around the kind of late eight minutes, early nine minute times. When you have perfect conditions and two years on of some development of that 488, uh, those are the changes that can be created. So now, at this point of, of proceedings, Ben, I was about to turn to you and uh, ask you who, who you thought was going to win, but conveniently, we're going to talk about highlights, so you might have been saved by the bell there. <laughs> uh, I will get your thoughts 
maybe later on in the weekend about that. So two separate qualifying sessions. Tyres, by the looks of things, being called very late by certain cars. But unfortunately for Glickenhouse, who were due to be in the first session, they didn't get any further than the Grand Prix track when they had to go into the pit lane via the back door. Gremlins there that we shall get to the bottom of in due course. Everybody else was waved off, though, in their correct positions, including from the front of the pack, the 116 of uh, Tim Heinemann for KTM. Unfortunately for his teammate Ferdinand Stuck in the 117, that car wouldn't get much further than Hatson back and caused dramas for other cars in the session, either those that uh, were about to start their first lap or others that were about to commence lap number two. KCMG not hanging around with Earl Bamba at the wheel and Matteo Cairoli as well. Missed the moment for Falcon Motorsport, I have to say, early on in the session. With so many cars circulating all at once, the um, it was always tricky to stay on top of exactly what was going on around a 25-kilometer circuit. But Ferdinand Stuck out of the session early, and he, I suppose, could turn his attention to race mode together with his teammates in the 117 for tomorrow. Maro Engel happy i think with the work that he did in the first session although ben you were suggesting that uh, maybe you know conversations with jules gunon suggesting the car wasn't quite in the sweet spot and it was 12th come the all important session yeah best of the mercedes down there in eighth position with lucas stoltz um, i was tipping mercedes for this being their year uh, but uh, it does seem as though Behind Audi, behind BMW, only Porsche one position back in ninth, the best of theirs. The Uber Motorsport, Nico Menzo, who was, I think, one of the last cars uh, to complete uh, a lap time. But the Octane 126, Luca Ludwig driven Ferrari was out there uh, in the middle order, but it started to set green and purple sector times very early on, it was mighty through the very long two and a half minute sector seven section. And Luca Ludwig is on pole position for the 2022 edition of the Nürburgring 24 hours.
This is me, one, two, three. That's great, it's just one and two this time. So this is me on one, and this is Becky on two. Hello, hello, can you hear me? A little bit. Hi, am I nice and clear? Yeah. Hello. All good? Keto. Okay. Just the two of us. Just the two of us. Just the two of us. We can sing that if you want, but probably <laughs> you won't want to. <laughs>
Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a beautiful late afternoon, early evening. I think it's evening now, 8 o'clock local time here in the Eiffel at the Nürburgring Nordschleife for the uh, Total Energy 24 hours, the ADAC 24 hours for 2022. And we're bringing you some extra coverage here on the international stream and around the world on RS1, part of the Radio Show Limited network of channels. I'm John Hindoff in the commentary booth. It's time for Falcon Drift. And you will be delighted to know that whilst I'm no stranger to going sideways in cars, it's normally en route to having rather a big moment. So I know a little bit about this, but fantastic news is I've got some help and it's in uh, the form of the extremely knowledgeable Becky Evans who's alongside me. Becky, welcome to the booth. These are your people. This is your sport. Yes, thank you so much. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Obviously, we're back here at the Nürburgring. It's brilliant to see so many people coming out to see the racing, see the action. And we're here for the Falcon Tires Drift Show. And as you were saying, I'm no stranger to a drift track. I, um, I work for Red Bull Drift Masters, so the biggest European championship that we have here. And I am the host for that. So it's brilliant to see some of my drivers here and uh, a lot of new faces as well. Yeah, but stop all that. You're hiding in light under a bushel here. You drive these cars, you've completely you've got experience in that you've still got an s15 that you've had for quite a long time still running on its on its standard original engine and we'll talk about the technicalities of this in terms of the car builds and the engines as we go through um, how long have you been involved with this sport so I've been around drifting now for around four years. I started because I wanted to get into a grassroots motorsport and drifting is very much grassroots, starting at the very bottom and allowing people to come through with quite simple cars mm. all the way up to the machinery that you see on the track here today, which is really technical and very much pro spec. So yes, I started with a series called Drift Queen where I built my very first drift car, which was the S15. And, and that Could car- never get rid of that now. No, I, that car will stay with me forever. <laughs> and as, as you say, she's still original S. 20 still original gearbox although I am on my third gearbox but we'll talk about that later um, but yeah brilliant brilliant cars and a wonderful sport and delighted to be a part of it at the moment the uh, guys are just sorting themselves out in terms of uh, getting the feel for the the track down at the bottom of the Grand Prix circuit at uh, Mullenbach Schaefer uh, down at the the hairpin at the bottom of the hill uh, it looks a very simple corner but uh, talking to a few of the guys earlier on, there's a real opportunity here to get some speed up because it's not just about sideways, it's about speed and drifting as well and commitment. Absolutely, with drifting you want good speed, you want brilliant commitment and also the thing is it might look like they're spinning the tyres up but the aim of the game is grip here. They want as much grip as they're coming into that corner as possible to be able to break the traction and still be able to make that car move on the line that they are. And that's actually almost counterintuitive to what we would think when we see these cars being thrown into a slide or provoked into a, a slide either by flicking the car or using the handbrake, hydraulic handbrakes. These cars will have because you think all right let's blow the tires right up let's get all the, tr the, the you know overheat them to get the grip but that wouldn't give you forward progress and that speed element is super important so that these cars are actually quite softly sprung and suspended at the back Absolutely right. You know, a lot of these guys that you'll see coming down here, they'll be running quite low PSI tyres because they want the car to squat down and get as much of the tyre onto the track, do you know what I mean? Use as much tread width as possible to get that grip because although, as I say, you are spinning the wheels and you're creating the smoke effect that you see, you do still want that forward bite. So you need a lot, a lot of side grip for that as well. So it's all a very technical process. You know, it, it looks great fun, but there is a lot of uh, technicality that goes into it. A lot of finesse, finesse. as well. Now, as I say, I'm no stranger to going sideways. It's normally en route to something going horribly wrong in circuit racing. <laughs> Although I, I, I did a little bit of rallying as well, where Scandinavian flick, getting the car sideways. Now, normally you do that in rallying to scrub off speed and to get the car with a pendulum movement, which I'm now doing in the comms box, which of course is... I popular. like it. Do you like that? I like it. I've got a bit of style there. I can't do it properly in a car, but I can pretend I'm doing it in my head. Um, here it is as much about getting the car to the right attitude and I've seen you know I've seen enough of this to know that it's almost 90 degrees to the direction of travel it's extraordinary what kind of modifications 
have to, we have the car's got to have at the front end to be able to get that that steering lock enough angle on the steering so you'll see the cars i mean they're running or uh, some, sometimes you'll see them coming down they've got almost 60 70 degrees of angle but the front you'll see sometimes the uh, wheels are sitting a little bit prouder it's because a lot of them are running what is called wise fab which is kind of an extended knuckles on the front here right. which enables the wheel to be able to get as much pitch as possible you know like and they're running quite a lot of caster as well but a lot of it is to do with these extended yeah. uh, hub knuckles at the front here caster is like your supermarket trolley so what you want to do is you want to get as as much in front of the pivot point on the wheel as you can and what that allows you to do and you do this in rally cars as well and to a certain extent to on circuit racing cars when you have to get a load of opposite lock on if you then leave go of the wheel the wheel will spin back now the skill is catching it in the right place and not dislocating a thumb quite yep. honestly yeah guess who's done that before uh, so <laughs> that's a, that's the caster angle the angle that makes the wheels always want to point forward when you're going forward like i say think of your supermarket trolley just caught a, a quick glimpse of uh, rick van gertham there in the bmw m5 v8 drift taxi this is one of our only lady drivers that is joining us here uh, this weekend they're actually a couple himself and herself here they both have matching uh, v8 mustangs i went over and had a chat with her earlier she was so nervous bless her but it, i was just delighted to see a lady driver out here in germany but she did an absolutely great run there so she should be delighted with that uh, and that was was that uh, what number car was that? That was uh, Jan Mering, was Yeah, Romy, her name is. Romy uh, Velberg. Yeah. yeah, that's it, absolutely. 5.6 litre V8, 450 brake horsepower, matching car with her husband. I Love mean, it. it's brilliant, right? You know, to have hey. a, a married couple out here drifting together. The, the, the couple that drift together stay together, apparently. We, we, we <laughs> like to think that. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic stuff. So at the moment, we're seeing single runs. Uh, all the drivers are dialing themselves and their cars in. They'll have put a brand new set of Falcon tyres on before they came into this part of the arena. There's a good crowd here on a beautiful evening and a fantastic selection of cars, including some local drivers from around Germany. But clearly, this is a big sport, has been for quite a long time. And there's a pro scene here, Becky. Yeah, there is. There's very much a pro scene. Uh Big enough in Germany, but across Europe, we have, I think we have something like 27 nations that come to join us at Driftmasters. So, you know, drifting has a universal appeal across the globe. We have big championships here in Europe. Uh, we have them out in America as well with FD. That's a huge, huge championship out there. Yeah, Formula Drift. And we have an FD driver here with us as well today. Obviously, James Dean is a three-time FD champion and Falcon Tire driver for the last, I think it's coming up 12 years now. Um, and he's come out here just for this just for this drift demo this weekend. So he would have competed against people like Von Gitten Jr. Absolutely. Who we know from our time in, in IMSA, uh, coming to, to, to have a look at us in the IMSA Championship and the previous to that, the American Le Mans series, did a lot of work with Ford as, an, as one of their ambassadors. Um, the, the cars themselves then, um, clearly they're not standard uh, and quite clearly they have to have some modifications or are they built i mean, I mean they haven't just none of these drivers have just pulled these cars off the street have they no not quite i mean obviously you're going to see a lot of different um a lot of variation with the cars here i mean obviously what we're looking at right now is an r35 gtr which has got an lsx engine in it i mean some would say taking a vr engine out of an r35 you, that's a good engine but yeah, no yeah. he wanted the scream of an lsx in there so that's steve biagioni he's a, a uk monster driver also one of our drift masters drivers so that's a v8 so he's taking the straight yes. six out of that and it, straight six is out a turbocharged v8 he has put an lsx V8 in there, yes. You could, the noise of it is insane when you're stood next to that car and it has such presence on the track. So how much then is power important? Power and torque important and a nice, a nice flat torque curve so that you can control that? Yeah, I mean, power is obviously very important, but sometimes, you know, you're trying to get that grip down. So if you're overloading the tire constantly because you've just got so much power that you're blowing the tire off all the time, it's actually not manageable. So, you know, some of the cars out here, there's a range of different um, power outputs. I mean, you've got some down here about 450 up to James, which is around 900. I'm... Um, <laughs> 
I know, it sounds ridiculous. That's excellent. I know. Uh, this uh, this car just here, this is Remo Nees, and this is actually a brand new car which is just brought out. He's been building this over the last couple of years. I know that he wanted to debut it, uh, I think, in 2020, but we all know what happened in 2020. Oh, yeah. And uh, had to be put on the back burner a little bit. But it's wonderful to see Remo out here. He's a veteran of the sport. And it's a 2JZ 1M, BMW 1M with a 2JZ straight six in it. So where's that come out of? The 2JZ to 2JZ engine, that is a BMW engine. 2JZ is actually out of a Toyota Supra. Supra, It's right, a Supra, okay. yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Understood. See, I'm having to catch up with, with all of this. Uh, and that's that's the same engine that James Dean's got in his e E92. Correct, correct. Yeah, he runs two JZs in all of his uh, drift cars. Just some, oh. what makes a good engine for drifting then? Because clearly they're getting. Uh, you're not just revving them on the rev limiter here, but they are getting a, a, a bit of work, shall yeah. we say, in short bursts, and that's not yeah. normally a good thing for an engine. The, the 2JZ has become a very, very popular engine within drifting simply because they've got a very, very strong butt mend. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very, you, you can get a lot of power out of them relatively easy. You know, Without turbocharging? Or well, you do. You, you ha would have a turbo. You still have a turbo on it, right? These are turbo, but you can get NA 2JZ uh, uh, blocks. But a lot of these cars will be running um, turbo but yeah, they were one of the biggest reasons why 2Js became so popular is because they were really easy to get power out of. They were pretty reliable and relatively easy to source. We've had, I think, the first set of single runs. We're just uh, seeing one or two drivers having another go. Michael Zavelberg in the Ford Mustang, husband uh, of um, Remy there, who we saw a little bit earlier in the number 19 Mustang with those two uh, matching cars. That looks like about an 06 Mustang with the early rear lights. Yep. On that, going through now with a very Mondrian yeah. uh, livery on the number 10. That's uh, Peter van Hurek uh, from Belgium with a V8 BMW. Absolutely. I, I, I looked at that car earlier and I was like, what is that? Rep? It's Mondrian, isn't yes. it? It's Mondrian. We had a Peugeot that ran in uh, World Endurance Championship, or the pre precursor to that, that was very like that. Good crowds turned out today. This is always a big Friday night evening out for the crowds who are in there, hundreds of thousands here, of course. Manuel Schrimpf in the Skyline R33. Yep, RB25, uh, lovely car. Really nice. And following him through in a cloud of fault and tire mm -hmm. smoke. I can't even see the car. You you <laughs> might be able to work out who I'm, that was. I'm pretty sure They're that... not going in number order now. They've mixed themselves up. It looked to me like Max Heydrich just back there. Okay. He is, uh, I'll take your word for he's, that. Uh, he's another seasoned driver from Diff Masters. Little, little 1M. This is the number 20, yep. uh, Gerard Doy from the Netherlands, big sport in the low countries, uh, drifting in the little compact, in the little stubby, and followed that up with, I think this might be my favourite car. This is the number 16, the blue and white uh, S15, yep. another Belgian, is uh, Hendrix. Yeah, he's got an LS3 V8 in that one, so he took out the SR20 and changed it straight for a V8. You'd normally find an LS3 in a Corvette or a GM, Big V8, lovely engine. I once had one as a hire car when I was in the uh, Middle East, <laughs> had an engine. I, I worked uh, for, for a little rifle for Reuters in the second Gulf War, and uh, basically I wanted the biggest, fastest engine I could get so that I was a very fast-moving target. Uh, and it was, uh, it was in a Chevy Impala Triple S, basically. Fabulous. Which was basically like a Holden Commodore with a LS3 in it. This is a Chaser. This is one of the guys. There's two. Uh, you'll see two of these cars. They might think you might think it's the same car, but it's not. They have two identical cars. One is a 1JZ engine. One is a 2JZ engine. Um, and yeah, they just seem to be out there having some fun together. So that was a that was a two-door coupe Toyota Chaser. Ch yeah. Now we didn't get that in the UK. That was a that was no. a Japanese car. So what? Does, Absolutely. What does that most closely relate to that we might have seen in 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 Europe? Because um, I know that they had some uh, um, with the. Texas brand as well, they had some different, yeah. but you see them in um, Gran Turismo and things like yeah, that, you yeah, yeah. them early on to do your tests. Yeah, no, 100%, who's, who's popping down here? This looks like James Dean throwing on the angle. Now he was saying earlier that the oh, entry... <laughs> yeah, 
he loves to drive with a lot of angle just to show how the, you know how well the car can move and just how dramatic it is on track you know he was saying earlier that's over 100 mile an hour entry speed on this corner obviously we're watching from a screen but it is really quite a long corner I big can, entry speed i can only imagine what that's like down in the arena itself right we're starting the tandem runs now the double runs and and this we would see in competition and we're starting with the two falcon bmws <laughs> i really like the color scheme now if we were scoring this the lead driver would be trying to do the best time and the best amount of drifting that he could. The second driver is trying to stay as close as possible. Absolutely. So do you know if this was a competition situation, you would have clipping points out on your track here. So you might have one on the inner corner, outer corner, outer zones, this, uh, this, that, and the other. And the aim of the game for the lead car would be to get their car into all of the inner and outer zones. And then the car following along, if this was a lead and chase run, he would be trying to mirror the car in front and also get as close closest proximity to the other car as he could whereas a lead driver will be looking to have the best qualifying line so anybody who's watched uh, formula e and sees the power-up zone in there um, now that's projected onto the track from the tv companies yeah what we see in drift is is hash marks quite often painted onto the inside or the outside of the circuit so the drivers can actually see what they're aiming for to slide the car across absolutely so you, uh, the judges and uh, the organizers of the event would go out there and they would paint the hash mark boxes out onto the track so you have a visual but also in the briefing the drivers would have a very uh, thorough briefing to let them know where they were uh, one of the things i've noticed when i've seen this at Long Beach as part of the uh, Long Beach Grand Prix when we're there for, for IMSA is quite often we see cars with their tail lights knocked out. Now, mm. that's not necessarily a mistake there because if there's a wall there, the idea is to get as close to it as you can without hitting it. Well, yeah, do you know what? Drifting is a lot about flair. I mean, look, we can see oh, here. Nice, <laughs> nice. <laughs> we can see from Ron van der Rehl. Yeah. M6, that's a big car to do that with. Th that is a huge car to do. <laughs> If you've ever driven an M6, you know how big those things are. So for him to do a lovely little 360 there. But getting back to what you're saying, drifting, there's so much personality in the driving. You know, Rohan, you can already see, is cheeky chappy. That's, the, that's him all over. He does that doing a spin into the pub. Do you know what I mean? So, like, it's got so much personality in the driving styles. And, yeah, to be honest, it's it's very key. It's very key to the to the start. And as you were saying about the lights, um, like people like to get nice and close, but it's almost who's got the bigger cojones? Who right. can get as close? as you can and who can uh, you know give it a little wall tap give it a little tap there i like that yeah that a bit of a show off that massively there yes. you go that's a little bit of a show off but i think well you're not going to be a shrinking violet if you're if you're doing this another single run from that lovely uh, nick hendrix uh nissan s15 the man from Belgium, the blue and white car. And here's the lead follow, next lead follow group. Now, you see, they've got a bit split up. You, you would lose points as the chasing driver for that. That's way too far away. You want to be almost on the rear three-quarter of the car. 100%. You know, your job as the chase driver is to mirror exactly what your leader is doing. So he got a little bit of separation there, Got maybe got a bit lost in the smoke. Uh, yeah, that wouldn't go down well with judging criteria. So he might lose a few points there. Hey, Steve, again, in that R35. Thankfully, though, this is all good fun. This yes, is nobody, no, but this isn't. We're not scoring points here, thank goodness. I, I did bring a pen and a piece of paper just in case we <laughs> uh, needed to. We haven't talked about uh, Robin Zvan, uh, Zvanenberg in the E92 BMW. He was the lead car there yep. as he went through. Beautiful car, still running the original engine. That's an S65 V8. I have an E92 M3 myself, so I'm very, very fond of those cars. And the S65, to me, is probably one of the best sounding V8s that BMW ever made. So, yeah, he's not even running a super charger he's just running the s65 uh, e92 m3 as it was supposed to be as, it was, as to it was supposed to be as it was supposed to be here's the two falcon cars just uh, doing another run in fact they're swapping around so they'll they'll swap the lead driver next time around the number six is mark visser in the z4 with a v8 which of course it never had as a production car mm. although the racing versions did get one specially homologated very true again this is running the same s65 engine that i was just talking about from an e92 m3 that car used to belong to to, um, it used to belong to Remo, actually. He used to use that as a competition car. And nice. Yeah, so, you know what? It's sharing is caring, the Falcon family. Uh, they, uh, have their, they have the cars and they work them between themselves. Uh, how, how big a sponsor and how big a partner to the drift 
competition side of things is Falcon then? Because it's a name that, that we absolutely associate with, particularly here at the Nürburgring. We've seen them racing in the in the US uh, in the ALMS days. Actually, probably that's why Von Gitten was was there when Falcon were as a tire supplier for the yep. uh, for the for the Ford Mustang uh, for the Ford Mustang for the Ford GT40 and then for the Porsches. Um, how how involved are there as as a partner? Falcon has been a huge supporter of drifting for many, many years. And obviously, they have their drivers here in Europe, as you can see the four guys in front of you. And also in America, they still very much a very big pre presence over in FD, where they have, yeah, some, you know, have Odie Bakshi, he's running an S15 for Falcon tires, Justin Paulak in the Mustang for Falcon tires, and also Matt Field, who is in. I'm going to say Corvette. It's Corvette. It is, it is Corvette. A Corvette. <laughs> I, was I was just thinking then, I was like, is it Corvette? Oh, I put no, it's Corvette. Um, so, yeah, very much a uh, big presence still. We're seeing a, a number of different... Uh, a number of different styles and a number of different ways to get into the drift. Notice that the, the, the first drift, obviously, is a right-hand corner, so you want to get the nose of the car pointing to the inside. But you'll see some of the guys are just having a little tweak on the handbrake. Uh, ooh, oh, 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 that's one off in the oh, gravel. I'll come back to that in a moment. That's oh, a, yeah. that's a shame. Oh, don't bury yourself. Now, that's uh, Robins Vandenberg okay, in his 1992. He's just about got out, but he'll have sprayed uh, gravel all over the place. There's a few different ways that you can unsettle a car and get it talking to you. Yeah. From my rallying days, you could, for this corner, you could flick it left before you flicked it right, the yep. so-called Scandinavian yep. flick. flick. The handbrake entry. just came on there on the lead car on the number 18, Sean yep. Toyota Chaser. Yeah, you can definitely see which uh, which way some drivers decide to get into their drift. Obviously, you can do, as you say, very much, you can do a flick entry where you just sort of, you, you're shifting the weight of the car over violently to initiate it into the drift, then using the power to get yourself out of it. Um, you can also just do the straight handbrake. You know, you're coming down, you pitch the, pitch, on the clutch, grab your handbrake, and then obviously turn so you get your angle of attack, and then off, you, off, off the clutch, and then you'll bang straight back into your accelerator. And then the other one that you would do is a clutch kick entry, which is obviously you clutch kick the car, which sort of violently breaks the traction, and then back on the power, and that's how you're going to initiate your drift. Very similar to how people pop wheelies on motorbikes. Correct. So, so you, you just pull the clutch in, give it a rev, and then drop the clutch really harshly, not like you would do to pull away gently as you're coming out of the of, of the shopping mall or away from the traffic lights and then you're braking traction at the back all the things that you don't do if you're trying to drive smoothly but once you've got it sideways rock aping the car isn't going to help you a lot of people just think oh you get it sideways you plant your foot you put it on full opposite lock and the car will just stay there that is not how to do this no, not at all. There is a lot of adjustments that you're making. You know, you're constantly just trying to uh, adjust the angle of the car and adjust your acceleration input. And, you know, you might even also be reaching for the handbrake again because if you're starting to get too much angle, they always say yeah, you can put on more angle, but you can't take it out. So if you're getting towards yeah, the end of your good. lock, then you're, you're going to start getting yourself into trouble, which you can see sometimes, you know, people come in way hot into this corner. And by the time they're already at the end of the steering rack, it's a bit too late. So you need to constantly be adjusting and keeping an eye on where the where the angle of the car is talking to james dane early on he says that he likes to run the brake bias very much to the front of the car and often when, it, when he's in the slide he'll even be balancing it with a little bit of left foot braking as well as working between the clutch so there's a, there's a lot going on here feeding the wheel making little adjustments throttle and brake working together yeah, it's so a bit of a ballet, really, is it? It is, absolutely. I mean, he likes to say it's, it's an Irish dance, right? Because <laughs> he's, he's running a 2JZ um, turbocharged car. So also, you've you got to remember, you've got quite a lag with those engines. So you're constantly trying to keep the revs up whilst you're on the clutch. Then you're also on the handbrake. So you're on the handbrake, keeping the revs up. Then you're back on the power. And then you're going to sort of float your left foot over the brake pedal just to give it enough to balance the car. Because you don't want to be making, as we were talking earlier about the suspension setups, obviously, mm. the back is quite soft. So if you're constantly on the handbrake, you're going to get this donkey rider effect going on so you yes. just want to balance the car nicely with the left foot braking and, there. and when it all works and when you see a very good exponent and we have some very good exponents here it all looks effortless and and yet to make that it's the swan effect isn't it to make Correct. that lovely smooth slide here we're seeing the the number 11 uh, which is uh, Shari Orige in the Toyota 
chaser, the, the second of those two uh, little hatchbacks, uh, little uh, fastbacks, excuse me. There's so much going, going on beneath the surface to get that nice, smooth transition from left to right. Absolutely. Do you know, they, they say it's like dancing with cars, drifting has, has this, uh, they call it the figure skating of, of driving, do you know what I mean? Because you are essentially trying to get the car to, to float and dance, but there's just a lot to, uh, that, uh, to make the cars do that. Right, the, the two fault of BM, and that's, I think they're both BMWs under yeah, there. They yes, are. they are. E39 M5. That's lovely. Yeah, that's a, that's a U car, do you know what I'm thinking? Oh, like that, listen, that is absolutely up my strata, <laughs> that car. I remember that car. I could never afford one back in the day. I think that's such an elegant car. People will say, hang on a second, uh, an M5, that's far too big a car. But when you look at it now, it's actually not that big a car. I think it's beautifully proportioned. And to see it completely sideways, as yeah. it is here, in some ways looks a bit wrong, but I think that makes it right. 100%. Yeah, the E39 M5 is very much it. It's, a, it's an iconic car from BMW there, but obviously had such a strong V8 engine in it. And yeah, when you see that thing floating towards you, flat chat, 90 degrees, you think, Jesus, that's not supposed to do that, really. <laughs> but, but that's the beauty of drifting, you know? Like, you're, you're, you're controlling a car that's essentially out of control. D does it... C can you make a drift car out of any body style? I, I mean, a lot of these drivers are part of teams there are constructors who specialize in this and obviously you have to have the safety equipment so there's a roll cage in there the suspension quite a lot of the suspension will be will be bespoke there's certain things you can't do like you can't move the top mounts and things like that because yep. they've got to be scrutinized they've got me effectively homologated but could you pretty much start as a base car with anything or are some cars just inherently better than others length between the wheels that sort of stuff yeah, I mean, obviously, technically, technically, you could make any car into a drift car. But however, you know, first of all, you need to look at the weight proportions. You obviously want a weight bias, lighter at the rear, heavier at the front, so most likely more of a front engine car. Then, first of all, you don't want to rearrange the entire engineering of the car, so you want to start potentially with a, a rear-wheel drive car yes. instead of trying to convert a front-wheel drive. So do you know what I mean? You're Good sort point. of, you're, you're cutting off different cars here at left, right, and center with these specifics that you, that you need. And some cars, I mean, this is why the Nissan Silver Sylvia has been so popular as a drift car. You know, they just they just drift better. They're just set up. They're just engineered better. The Japanese even had it. before you start specifically tuning them for drifting. So even as a street car, and let's not forget, like most great forms of motorsport, whether it's endurance racing, which was originally point to point from towns uh, when the motor car first came out, drag racing started on the streets, and you know, the, those of you who live around my neck of the woods down at uh, Santa Port, it's there. Big weekend coming up with first the FIA it's meetings the main, there. It's the main event this weekend, actually. Yeah, this weekend. Is that this weekend? Yeah, my, right. fr my friend Annie Wallace will be out there with the uh, Promog oh, car this weekend. I've known Keith Bartler for about a million years. I remember him racing back in the back in the 1970s, yes. late 1970s, before he took it over. But drifting started on the streets in Japan. In Japan, yes. So, uh, you know, they had the Toge roads. Oh, look at this. Look at it go. Delighted She's for actually her. Sp has she spun off the... No, it's no, just she's a still going. It's I quite thought she spun off the rear tyre there for a quite, moment. quite a heavy car, that's, uh, you know what I mean, with the Mustang. So she's still going. She's just uh, she's getting round in her circles. I I've been Lovely. up around the roads around Mount Fuji um, when we've been racing over there. And there's a road on the far side down from Mount Fuji where you can absolutely... See, it's a beautiful curving road. It's a smashing road. You could do a great hill climb on it. Yeah. But, but at the weekends, you don't drive down it. You don't drive up it. That's not the way you come back from the track on a Saturday or a Sunday night because there are unofficial drift championships going on there. And you can see from the serpentine marks on the road. So that's where it started. How did it get across to Europe? And how did it get to be competitive and basically spread across the world. So obviously, yes, as you were saying, uh, drifting started in Japan. Uh, it started on the Togo roads that you talk about outside Mount Fuji. You know, lots of drivers became kind of like cult heroes, like the Nakamura's, the Tanaguchi's. Um, and then they started to create what was called, um, there was Initial D as well, which is the cartoon. And then they started their own uh, group, it's not Group D, what's the, it's 
not initial D either. D1, D1. sorry. D1. That yeah. was it. Sorry, I've got all the Ds. It's FDs. The, it's, there's this, always that, Ds. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so D1 then started over in Japan. Caught the eye of a lot of people. Obviously, then you've got New Zealand, which is not very far from Japan. A lot of drifting started to happen drift, in yeah. New yeah. Zealand. And then it just steadily but surely spread all over the world um, people were very much a fan of the culture and of the cars and I think you know especially in Ireland I think it started in around 2008 um, that drifting started in Ireland particularly and around that time just before that as well it was obviously coming to the UK with BDC and that sort of stuff but yeah this guy here, James Dean, 19 championships under his belt. Uh, arguably the, one of the best drivers in the world and definitely the most decorated, but comes from a small village in the south of Ireland. <laughs> Which you'd think, wow, that's so far away from the hills of Japan. But, yep, that's how much the sport has spread and as, uh, the love for it is universal. Uh, Shane Lynch, of course, formerly a boy zone, uh, yep. was a big, uh, big competitor. We had him at the, uh, the racing car show at... Birmingham and the indoor arena a few times. We had him on a couple of Top Gear live shows that I worked on and presented with Tiffany Dell as well. Uh, precision driving as well as sideways driving. Beautiful stuff from the two Toyota. That's a big car, you know. Like, uh, I'm just thinking, if, chases, if, if yeah. I was driving that, I would feel like, ugh, I don't know, a pee in a coconut, do you know what I mean? <laughs> but, the, but the other thing I notice about that is look how much overhang there is behind the rear wheels. Yeah. So judging where the back end of the car is, it's hard enough to judge where the front end of the car is, yeah. but the back end of the car, when you're trying to get those big slides close to walls and things like that, or when you're trying to get very close to each other. Uh, now, this is a nice touch. We've got some coloured... Because uh, I'm coloured smoke coming oh, out. Oh, look, yeah, so now, absolutely. It's that, like this is very cleverly done from the uh, of Paul, Paul Steenhuis, who's uh, the Netherlands right. driver in the BMW, the little stubby, the BMW Compact. He's in the Compact, which is the 4-litre V8, which is actually this engine, I think, is the, oh, gosh, the S62, S62 engine, which I think was, I can't even remember off the top of my head, but it's another 4-litre V8 from, now, uh, from that, BMW. That smoke is coming from the rubber on the tyres? Correct, yes. So these are the colour shreds red tires which uh, they have like I'm not sure it must be like a dye or something in the in the tires so as soon as they start shredding they emit this wonderful cloud of smoke I always think they look like gender reveals Is that <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the red arrows but you know <laughs> hey, you know what you go with yours well, I'm not sure what red says about them mind you that'd be good that would be a girl wouldn't it red, All right, girl. Okay. red pink for All right, a girl. We, we've had single runs we've had lead and follow up now we're going for a triple you would not see this in competition uh, no. this is just for the show and the three of the Falcon Tires cars are out there together in a triple full spin. Lovely stuff. Now, remember, these guys are not stunt drivers and precision drivers. They, they are drift drivers, but they have got all the silky skills. Oh, absolutely. And do you know what? These three guys, you've got Remo out there, you've got Rick Van Gotham, and you've got Rohan here. They're really good friends, and they've been driving with each other for a very long time. So to them, this is a bit of fun, a bit of crack, getting to go out there. And do you know, you're on the Nordschleife. What an amazing place and an incredible event this weekend to be out there on track in front of all these people. I love that. That's a, that's a really nice. I've not seen triple that uh, three up like that before, and they did that really nicely. Th this doesn't just happen by accident, of course. You have to practice this. You wouldn't do this in competition. And uh, this is the husband yeah, and wife this, team again. This is the couple. I'm so glad she's out there having some fun. As I said, I spoke to her earlier. She was quite nervous, and I said, "Go on, go. You're going to kill it." little bit of uh, confidence since she's out there rocking it. I love to see it. It's. I mean, the thing is here, there's, there's no points being awarded, so no harm, no foul. This is just go out there, do your stuff, have a bit of fun. I, I love it. It's brilliant. Might in, even inspire a bit of confidence at the next uh, at the next event and the next competition. Oh, 100%. And do you know what? Any driver gets a little bit of nerves inside them. I speak to any of my drivers and drift masters, and look how many people are sat out there, you know? And the thing about drifting is, you've got 30 seconds to get all of that right. Every yeah, move that you... Every move that you do has to be in sequence, on time, and perfect to the line that you're trying to get. So there is a lot of pressure um, on the drivers out there. You know, lots of them have different ways of chilling themselves out beforehand or different rituals before they go in. But honestly, it's uh, the pressure that the drivers feel is it's no joke. Here comes that very lovely survey again, the blue, black, and white car. It's a lovely looking machine, isn't it, the S15? Uh, it, it's, it is beautifully proportioned. And it, I mean, it, that's, whisper it, that's quite an old car now, but it still looks contemporary. If they were to roll that out now and tell you that 
this was the new car, you'd go, yeah, all right, yeah. I'll have, I'll, I'll, I'll be up with that. Yeah, yes, indeed. Cooper is coming back into style as well, of course, oh, with uh, Toyota reviving the Supra and the Super GR just coming out under thirty thousand pounds in the UK for four hundred plus horsepower mm. and a gearbox, <laughs> uh, i.e., three pedals. Oh, you're very much a manual man, aren't you? Oh. There you go. But I thought, I mean, I, I, I'm asking questions that I already know the answers to in a little bit, but we're, we're, this is for the viewer. You know me already. I know, I know. <laughs> I, I love Very it. standard looking BMW there for Gerard Doy in the 1M, the man from the Netherlands. Oh, who have we got here in a cloud of smoke? Oh, it's Bagsy. Gee, that car has so much power, it's ridiculous. Look at the camber on those front wheels <laughs> and the back wheels. Yeah, it's a really, really cool car. This R35 GTR Liberty Walk kitted. Um, and this is uh, his new livery for this year. Obviously, he's sponsored by uh, Monster here and ST Suspensions. The car looks insane. Like, this wouldn't be his uh, competition car. This would be the car that he does stuff like this, demos, just sort of showcasing uh, his driving talent and also what his team can build. SB Motorsport is Steve's um, team at home, which build his, his cars, because he also has a PS13 with another LS engine in for competition. So sometimes he joins us As you in did. drift. I know, yeah, he's got, he's got it all going on. But he does what you can see here, which is a total smoke out. It looks like he was uh, almost line locking the brakes there in drag race style, <laughs> uh, just to torture those uh, rear. Oh yeah, that's lovely rolling burnout coming up the hill yep. from the the hairpin. Uh, this guy here would have a lot of power. He's uh, one of our drift masters. Supercharger sticking out the top. It's that's really old school. I love it. And you'll know the supercharger. It's a Whipple supercharger on an LS, uh, on an, in an S15. So, you know, there's a lot of variation with these cars. You, you, you would think the Japanese car is definitely going to have the Japanese engine. No, it's got a V8, and the German car is going to have a Japanese engine in it. So there's a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of crossing and moving around. I like that idea. Now, again, back to the lead and follow. Actually, that was a pretty decent run pretty if that had been being scored, particularly through the long right-hander. Pretty sure that's Max Heydrich. He's another uh, professional driver. Here we have the guys again. We have Remo and we have Rohan. I know for a fact later that I'll be having a beer and uh, reliving this experience. They live for this event each year. Like, they just love it. And it's brilliant to see the Falcon tires still come here and put on this show every year. Serious question. Hit when you are that close yes. and doing the lead and follow in competition yep. and the smoke is pouring off the back wheels of the car in front, Yep. Can you get disorientated? Can you lose where you are? Because clearly visibility, it's like driving through the fog in the early hours over on the Nordschleife here. Absolutely. But getting lost in the smoke is one of the driver's worst nightmares because if you just drop off the line just that little bit and then you are in that smoke trail, you, you can see nothing and you're doing 50, 60 miles an hour sideways and then suddenly... Whew, you know, you can't see anything. So it's very much uh, a lot of the drivers really don't want to get lost in the smoke, but unfortunately, yeah, it does happen sometimes in competition. There's going to be a lot of people watching this saying, I'm loving this idea. Um, quite clearly, you can't, and neither should you, and neither would we, uh, abs absolutely would we would say you should not be doing this on the public road. There's a time and a place for everything, and you're not probably going to want to burn up your new set of Falcon tyres uh, doing this yourself either. Are there places that you can go, like you can go to do uh, testing a, a cart, um, like an arrive and drive sort of thing? It, are, there, are there such places where you can go and sample this and find if you're, if you're any good? Because it's quite specialised in the machinery. 100%. There is a lot of drift schools popping up. I know there's a good few in the UK. Um, I actually learned at a drift school when I first started drifting because it's a really great way just to sort of get yourself in a car, figure out if you even like it. And also they have great trainers on hand there. So, you know, if you really were looking at this and thinking, yeah, do you know what? I'm going to get myself into drifting. Before you do all of the investment and buy yourself a car and, do you know, all of the modifications that you need. Oh, that was very nice. Oh, that's lovely. That, that is about as good as it gets in lead and follow. I don't think there was a yard between the two cars there. Yeah, two friends that know each other very well, because a, a big thing when it comes to the, the chase and lead is, is trust, because mm. at the end of the day, you're going full power, the other guy's going full power, and you, you need to know that he's, he's going to still push on and not you know, do something that you're not expecting. So those guys put on a really lovely show because they're both full power. I, the, the thing I love about that M5 mm -hmm. is that other than the livery, 
It's absolutely stock bodywork white. I mean, you could you, you could put that on the street with a plain colour and nobody would know what it is. It's the ultimate straight sleeper without the Falcon tyres livery, of course. Back to triple, running again. This you wouldn't see in competition. This is fantastic stuff. What, what are the biggest mistakes then? What are the most common mistakes, Becky, that people make when they go to drift school and, and when they're getting into this? It's a, it's a very hard concept sometimes to get your head around. A lot of us that have been driving and done a lot of driving practice have been taught the, you know, exploring the edge of the grip, right? You've always been told to keep your traction. You, you, you want as much traction yeah. as, you, as you can to get the best time to keep yourself flying around those corners. Here, we're telling you to completely unlearn that. We're, trying, we're telling you that you need to break traction. Yes. You need to unsettle the car. You need to flick the car and then go into a transition, you know, a weight transition. But, whoa, we've got four cars quad now. Run, a quad run now. Uh, BMW, Nissan, BMW, and on the back yeah, is another, another BMW. BMW. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 92, I think, at the back. Is that, uh, I'm not sure. They're getting nice and confident now. We're going. Well, this is all going to go horribly wrong at some but stage. Do you know it doesn't, though? On the, on the drift practice days that I've been to, they send cars in trains like this. So you might be in a train of six of you. No. I swear, honestly. And it's like everybody is just chasing each other, having great fun. Honestly, you are watching these guys having a lot of fun out on the track there. So, no pressure of competition here, of course. We, we, mm. we, we aren't, these guys aren't getting scored about it. So, so breaking traction, uh, trying to unlearn all of those habits that we are taught, whether we've been driving on the roads, certainly if we've been track driving, um, to a certain extent it's driving for effect, but you still have to be under control. So it's a new set of control skills that you are learning. 100%. A lot of the thing, uh, I would say, I'm going to speak personally from my own experience. When I first started drifting, one of the hardest things that I had to think was predicting the weight transfer. So, like, yeah. when you launch the car in and get on the handbrake, what goes left must come right. So it's then being able to catch that transition, control it, and you have so many inputs. You know, you have six inputs. You have steering input, you have throttle input, you have left foot brake input, you have clutch input, you have hydro handbrake input, yeah. and you also have gears. I think that's six. Someone will tell me the six. But you know, there's, there's a lot of things that you can do to control that car and to keep that drift moving forwards, you know? So it, it's just learning the process. A lot of it's timing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you don't want to catch that once it's starting to make that weight transition, you want to be able to catch it, as you said earlier, about without breaking your thumb, catch that self-centering steering wheel at the right time and be able to put the right input in. Thumbs uh, up is always the right <laughs> way. Remember, <laughs> thumbs up. Always never wrap your hands oh. around when you're trying to catch that. Thumbs up and you catch the edge, the absolute edge of the steering wheel. I let go oh, of it. Well, no, I, I've done that before. When a car gets very, very sideways, let the car come back to you yep. and leave go when it's straight. Do you put a bit of tape or something on the on top dead centre of the of the of the steering wheel? A lot of people, a lot of people would have a centre mark, yes. Yeah. But to be honest, you have a. It's, it's it's hard to explain, but once you start doing it enough, yeah, you have stone, you, yeah. you have an innate sense yeah. of sort of where where that is. Um, but yeah, as you were saying, I would say the number one thing that I, uh, I found difficult was just the timing of everything. So. Are you more likely to just overcook it and spin it? So, okay, let, let's assume we're doing a drift school now, yep. and you okay. put me in the car. All righty. Right, so I'm charging down the hill yep. towards this. First thing is probably I'm not going fast enough because I'm sure most people don't understand about the kind of spell. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello, James. That was commitment. So he's doing nearly 100 miles an hour down there. There's no way that on your first goal you're going to have the confidence to do 100 miles an hour. Number two, you're going to turn in and start to get it going and your natural thing is to try and want to save it mm -hmm. so then it's either going to snap back the other direction and spear off to the left yep. or you're going to overdo it and spin it all the way around and spin overcook it exactly so you know as you were saying you're coming down you get yourself onto the handbrake <laughs> i love that it looks wicked doesn't it they're just out there having a lot of fun and that's our that's the r33 with the rb25 i'm pretty sure i'm um, out there it's a cool looking car to be fair. I always think when you look at Skylines, R33s, R32s, they're just such an iconic vehicle. 
It's uh, Manuel Schrimpf, uh, one of the German drivers. There's a beautiful Carl Sonic R32 running in the touring car it. legends. I saw it earlier. Is that not just one of the most beautiful things you've ever seen? Unreal. I, th I actually stopped that. That whole was racing today. Yeah, and it was with all the E30 M3s and the 190 Evos and stuff. Correct. That that race, I'll be honest, was my favourite race of the weekend. They, the car's they started serious. from here. They formed up on the grid right in front of us on the start finish line, which is yeah. where we're uh, watching from now. Uh, thanks to uh, colleagues for giving us the pictures and they did a, a, a standing start to move off and yeah, the unbelievable. noise was just oh, fantastic gosh. I, I'm such an old woman in a young woman's body do you know like <laughs> I, I look at these cars that you're just talking about and I'm like gosh you know I was born in the wrong era <laughs> but, but you could tell them apart and I mean you can tell all of these cars apart it, it's inter do you get contemporary model cars so would you get a, a new BMW would you get a, a, a newer um, some of the newer Nissans and stuff like that. 100%. I so mean, why, are the, why are the classic cars, why are the older cars more popular and still popular? More popular, I mean, a lot of it will be price. I mean, once you start, right. you know, with the brand new cars, you're going to be cutting up a brand new chassis, which is going to be quite pricey. Right. But second of all, it's, it's a well-known, tuned and tested chassis, which has lots of off-the-shelf parts that you can find and a lot, of, a lot of knowledge as well. You know, when you have a new chassis, it's brand new. Not many people have tested it, drifted it. You can't find that many parts for it. Right. But, you know, speaking of, you know, oh, Max oh. Heidrich throwing it in there. Good man, Max. Yeah, that was, that was lovely. He, he's a very committed driver. Um, yeah. <laughs> Do you think? I, I, yeah, he's, he's, he's good he at that. He was very committed. That, that he was hauling the mill there yeah. down the hill. Does it make a difference, the, the geography of the track? So we're coming downhill a little bit. It sort of flattens out. There's a little bit yeah. of camber on the, the corner. D does that make a difference to how easy or difficult it is to, to get the cars moving around? Oh, yeah. So if I was coming... Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. It's good. Only because I did this once. There's a track in Ireland, which is very similar. Big, long run-up, and then it goes down. Uh, obviously, you've got an elevation change there into sort of a camber corner. My, my goodness, the elevation change makes a big... Uh, makes a big change. Obviously, when you're coming down, you've got lots of high speed. That that velocity, that terminal velocity of you coming and trying to handbrake, you need to you need to plan for that, mm -hmm. so that you need to adjust your speed earlier because obviously you can very easily fly off the end of the track, as I so did. Ah, yes. As I so mm. did. So. The good news about doing it here uh, at uh, Mullenbachschleifer, the bottom part of the Grand Prix streck of the Grand Prix track is that there's actually lots of runoff. All right, you might get beached in the kitty litter, yeah. which would be a little bit embarrassing, um, but there's not much to hit. You, you could overcook it and hit the inside wall coming out of the corner. Uh, and also what they're doing is they're going back up the hill through the Michael Schumacher S and then just doubling back around on the shortcut that they actually use in the NLS races here, if you know that version, they're going the wrong way through there and then coming back down to, to form back up. So it actually works really well. It's very similar actually when they uh, do drifting at Road Atlanta, that there's the opportunity down through, down the hill to... Uh, yeah, to a left-hander. Ten, ten and, uh, nine and ten. Yeah, and, through and the then, keyhole. Th yeah, and then through back underneath the bridge and you can double back around fairly fairly easily through the pits. Good knowledge, pits area. good knowledge. Uh, another, one, another one of the tracks that... <laughs> <laughs> I was very impressed. Road Atlanta is an FD track. It's uh, yeah. super cool. Uh, it, it and again, that's a, that's a nice sort of uh, amphitheatre kind of yeah. area down there, much as we have at the bottom of the hill. Absolutely. Uh, been fortunate enough to do, turn some uh, some laps around there and some pretty nice machinery when we've been there for Petit Le Mans, which uh, we'll be back covering at the end of the year as the final race to the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. I was going to tell you, um, when we were talking about new cars, you know, we're seeing a lot yeah. of the new M4 GT. Oh, really? Three cars this weekend. Yeah. So there are a there are two brothers called the Drift Brothers, which are German guys, uh, Red Bull drivers, and they have two, not just one, they have two brand new M G82 M4s, which they've now created into uh, drift cars, still using their the, st the stock S58 engine, uh, obviously three liter six cylinder engine in mm. there, twin turbo, mm -hmm. stock internals, running nearly a thousand brake horsepower. So I oh, know. Sorry. 
Yeah. I'm sorry, something went wrong with my headphones there, Becky. I thought you said you stock me. internals. What? So they've beefed up the turbo chargers. Yep. And they're running a thousand, nearly a Very thousand nearly horsepower th on standard bottom end, standard crank, standard connecting rods, and everything else. Yeah, the thing is a monster, my friends. And honestly, you guys need to check out these two G82 M uh, M4s. Uh, they've been doing a little bit of work around uh, different tracks, but yeah, they they are an example of new cars coming into the scene. So that M5 that I've completely and utterly fallen for. <laughs> it says it, it you love that car, don't I you? I do. You keep coming back to it. I, re I really do. Um, that's that's Rick's car. Now it says drift taxi. Does that mean he takes passengers in that? Yep. So as it is a four door, is, would it be a sedan saloon? Uh, I, would, I, I think you could call it a saloon. Yes. Yeah, the four door saloon, very comfortable, very uh, couchy there, right there. So yeah, it's got four bucket seats in it. So oh. they actually use it as a drift taxi. So you know, normally uh, sometimes they have the sort of small drift paddock area, and people can come along and you can sit in the back of the car and go for a drift taxi ride, which is exhilarating, I imagine. I can I, I can think that it would be pretty exciting sitting next to the driver and being able to see the inputs that he's doing. But sitting in the back where the pendulum effect is taking I mean you're really gonna feel that movement because you're sitting pretty much on those cars on the rear axle. That is gonna be outstanding. Um, make sure that you um, if you're gonna eat something beforehand it'll not come back. Yeah. Or at least that it'll taste the same coming back as it did with uh, porridge. Porridge would be fine. Delightful. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, no. I painted a very <laughs> odd picture. I was like, oh, so visual there with that one. <laughs> uh, no, that's definitely happened before as well uh, because there's a lot of inertia, there's a lot of uh, sudden. Uh, Direction changing when you're in the car, but and when you're not controlling that, that, you, that can that, that can freak your inner ear out. Oh, now that is quality. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> side by side with the chase car right in the rear three quarter, and the crowd here appreciating that they knew that was good. So if that had been competition, yep. that would have been tough there to pick. If that had been a, a heat, a leg of a heat, that would have been tough to pick a winner there because they were very, very close indeed. Definitely. You know, uh, James is probably one of the best chase drivers in the world. You know, we've seen some incredible chases. Um, you can find a lot of them on TikTok, all across social media. Um, yeah, he's an incredible chase driver and one of the best. Are there some drivers who are better chasers than they are leaders and vice versa? I imagine so, but I'm bi I'm, I'm, I have to be completely unbiased. Okay. And, and, and okay. <laughs> That's fine. I, I imagine so. There are some that are, uh, favour one over the other. Some yeah. people prefer chasing. Some people obviously prefer leading. Uh, from a lead car point of view, when I'm doing a lead run, I'm literally fixated on the road ahead and not worrying about what your man's doing behind me. Yeah, so. almost want to sort of flip the mirrors out the way and not bother. Yeah, yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas chasing, y you're on high alert constantly trying to, f you know, when's he going to make the transition? When's he going to do this? What, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera, et cetera. Through again the uh, Robin Zwanenberg E92 Coupe, and that was a nice run by him. Um, these guys have been at this now for nearly an hour, mm. and this is a very oh no, this this oh. is get here we go. We're back into the 360s again from Robin. Oh, oh, oh. Just, just locked it up a little bit there, <laughs> but he's made something out of it. I like that. Um, how many sets of tyres in competition would you go through in in, a, in an event? Do you put a new set of tyres on pretty much for every run? Do you do you scrub some off? Do you, what is, what happens? Oh, he's going for another 360. He's feeling very fancy this evening. Yep, with tyres, you probably use, I'm going to say, around 40 tyres a weekend. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, if you're doing a chase and lead run, then you're going to use one set of rears for that chase and lead run. But if you think about it over the weekend, how many uh, runs that that would be, then, yeah, you would use 40 right. tyres. So, 20 sets. Oh, beautiful control there from Remo Neeson in the 1M with the 2 JZ engine. Just saw the brake lights coming on there. That was him just riding the brake with his left foot, just dancing on there balancing the car to keep this distance perfectly from the the leading car this is starting to ramp up now the skill levels now everybody clearly feeling comfortable they've laid a lot of fog and rubber down on the track surface now the two chasers are, are at it again the two toyota chasers the, those crossovers that's to me where the danger point is yeah. when the lead car changes direction and if you aren't in exactly the right place then 
you know, a side swipe or something like that. Do you get contact? Yeah, we do. We do. We do get a lot of contact because people are always pushing the boundaries here. We see James is coming in here. So he's right on Bagsy's door. He's got to wait for him. He's going to be looking to see where he's going to make his weight transition. And he's going to be looking and trying to get the timing right on the handbrake to just give himself enough space to get around the other side of him and, uh, yeah, and not make any contact. And he's looking out of the side window to do that. There was, yes. there was not a point there where either of those guys were looking out of the front windshield. No, they're looking to the side, obviously. Like, the aim of the game is you want to get as close to the other person that's on track with you. So you're looking exactly to see where your competitor is. Uh, and, yeah, and they're trying to paint, paint, paint a bit of their paint on the other person's door. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little bit... They call it a battle when you have yeah. two people on yeah, track. Yeah, battle, yeah. And it is that, you know, like, it's... it's who can who can be as close as possible paint those doors so is there an etiquette in that as well becky in that when you're the lead car mm -hmm. clearly you wouldn't want to or, or do you i don't know is the tactics involved where you might do something to try and throw the other person off or is that frowned upon that's frowned upon you know like a lot of all so of consistent you want to be consistent 100 percent. and also you know our competitors are some are some of the friendliest in the world i know many of my drivers uh would rather fight than forfeit if they have if the if their competitor has something wrong with their car if they need a, I don't know, a half shaft or a drive shaft or something, the actual person that you're going up against will give you their yeah. spare one to make sure you get out on track. And yeah. it's all love, it's all smiles, everyone gets out, big hug, win or lose. The three BMWs, the three Falcon livery BMWs there doing a triple. Now we've got the two chases out as well. Oh, almost got four together there. The crowd are getting them. Well, I was just saying they're getting their money's worth. This is a big yeah. free show down at the bottom of the hill yeah. at Mullenbach Schleifer. We've got to talk about the crowd. I mean, isn't it so wonderful to see this place full of people? And as you can see on the screen, I mean, we're watching from up here, but I can imagine the energy down there with everybody cheering, uh, just delighted to see the cars out having fun, delighted to see Falcon Tires putting on a show for us this evening. And just look at them. Hand out the window, doing a little rodeo donut right there. Love it. Ah, it's good crack. Lock up the, uh, try and lock up the front wheels. You can't, that, that is the effectively, that's a rolling burnout going round and round. So again, you're controlling the speed of the car. He's just drifting with his hand out the window. Oh, that's, that's too He's showing off. He's showing off. I can't way. imagine that anybody who does this would be a short. That's James Dean <laughs> yeah. going through. I think we're probably coming towards the, the end of the show. The number 12 is Mark Elbert. We've not mentioned him. That's a little E30 with a V8 in it as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, personally, I love an E30. I've got an E21 myself, uh, but that sort of style of car, I just love seeing them go sideways. They are tiny nowadays when you see them, aren't They're they? They're so small. Yeah. Absolutely it, tiny. So small, yeah. But they, they're brilliant cars. I've, there's, there's a couple of uh, E30s in the European drift scene, especially in sort of Poland, and I think it was in the Greek series that I saw a good couple of E30s. Neil Svisser well. going through there in the bright yellow and black. Number nine car. Yep. So we're just starting to see the sun drop down below the horizon, so the light will be going shortly. And they're still lining up for some more runs. Here's the yeah, husband yeah. and wife team again. The Zavelbergs. Yeah, here we go. In she goes. So what she'll be doing here is she'll just be putting a bit of luck on, uh, planting the foot to get it into a nice uh, pirouette there, and also just using the left foot brake to pitch the inner wheel, stop it moving around too much, and just doing some lovely... Lovely tandem donuts with her fella. Love it. What do you do on a Saturday night? Uh, Friday night, sorry. <laughs> well, possibly on a Saturday night as well, you know. <laughs> if you've got enough room in the drive, might annoy the neighbours just a little bit. <laughs> um, uh, when we were at the Race of Champions in Barbados a few years ago, we had some Ariel Latham race cars, mm. and we did um, some it. Jim Carner work with those, and they were so light on the front end that you could lock the inside front wheel and just spin yep. around a cone, and if you just let it off, you could just roll all it round, they yeah. were great fun. Not sure whether they make a great drift car because they're so short, they're pretty, pretty twitchy. Yeah, atoms are twitchy. They're, they're, I mean, amazing car, fast. Oh yeah, really? Crazy fast, but uh, anyway, drift cars, drift cars. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, we t we've talked about, could you make a drift car out of anything? Possibly not an aerial at them. You might have to lengthen it out uh, just a little bit. Right, who have we got coming down now? Another couple of BMs. And that is a nice little Manji down the straight there. Manji is where you see them doing the weight transfer. Ah. Like a nice little S uh, across the track there. Dennis Koss in the black and yellow car. It's an M3. Lovely. Haven't mentioned Dennis, so I thought we'd give him a run. A, a run for his money there. Here comes the... Boys back in town. Yeah. 
the three Fulton cars using that little bit of runoff down at the bottom just to pitch the car in sideways. Come on, catch up. That M5 needs to catch up. Come on, you're better than that. Come on, Rick. Get in there. You're letting me down, man. You're my favourite. I love this. Like, I've never seen a man so excited about an, an M5 drift car. But, but do you know what? There's a drift car for everybody. There is a drift car for everybody. That's that's very good. <laughs> that's very good indeed. So where are the big events coming up then? We're, we're in Europe. We're here at the Nürburgring this weekend. Um, if um, There'll be a lot of people, I, I guess, back in the UK uh, and around the world who are listening to this. But in, in Europe, where are the big events and, and how often do they come around? So we've got six rounds of... So we've got six rounds of Drift Masters this year. Um, we've already had our round one, which was at Mondello Park in Ireland. We are then heading to Austria on the 18th and 19th of June. Then we'll also be at Goodwood Festival Speed. We will have a wicked selection of drift cars that will be there going up the hill that Comedy weekend. Probably on that last year for Sky F1. Did you? Yeah, it's good fun. Oh, it's brilliant. And then we're heading actually to Sweden, um, and then Riga, and then Germany, and then the end of the year we are tarmacking a stadium in... Uh, clock in Poland for the round six really? which is the finals which should be oh, amazing I like the idea of stadium drifting I savage because you know what the energy in the room and the noise and the yeah. smoke and every it's my it's one of my favorite favorite uh, rounds especially because we did it in we did it in Plock last year we we're in lots I think this year stadium motorsport whether it's um, motocross monster trucks race champions there's something really almost like you shouldn't be doing it special yeah and, yeah and the crowd can be so close and the smell and the noise seems to be amplified it's really good now for, so, so that's drift drift masters drift masters yes right, so a website for that is uh so that will be just www.driftmasterseuropeanchampionship.co.com actually and as f the people, we've got people watching in America because the, it's a canny time for them on a Friday night. Um, in the States, what's the big championship out there now? That would be Formula Drift, the FD over in the States there. Very, very popular series, and you can find that. Anyway, they are huge on social media, one of the mm. biggest sports. They're, they're over a million followers on Instagram. Uh, Formula Drift is absolutely huge over there, very popular. And you mentioned down in the Antipodes, um, the New Zealand scene in particular. I know a couple of guys from Heart of Racing, Aston Martin team, oh, were down there. Have you seen that they've put a Aston Martin Vantage uh, on the track in FD? Sorry, yeah, the, the, uh, it's Heart Racing. Uh, yeah, Heart of Racing, they support yeah. the Seattle Children's Heart uh, Foundation, the Ch Seattle Children's Hospital. There it, oh, that's amazing. You know, I, I think it's absolutely brilliant. They've literally just taken the rule book and ripped it up. Who takes a brand new, brand new Aston Martin Vantage uh, with the V12 in it as well? And you just turn it into a drift car. The, they the do. The story behind that is actually quite interesting because two of the team um, had, had been away just before lockdown. And when COVID hit, they got stuck on the other side of the world and they couldn't come back to the States. When we went back racing in the States, the rest of the team carried on racing in 2020, but they still couldn't get back. So instead of just sitting around and having a holiday like I would have done, mm -hmm. they found out where the motorsport was in, oh. in New Zealand, including making friends with the drift guys down there. And that's how they got involved in drift. And they won a national championship Mad. in motor racing. And they raised a whole load of money for children's... Uh, a pa for paediatric uh, cardiac I love that down there and, and that's so you know something good came out of those guys being stuck down there in, in COVID lockdown Brilliant. well we get, we're getting everybody having a go now this is, this is like when everybody <laughs> comes back on stage at the end of a charity concert yeah. and they're getting everybody together <laughs> this is the grand finale everybody yeah uh, this, is, this is everybody playing around James is uh, doing a little lovely rolling burnout here is that James oh sorry apologies that is uh, what number is that one that I th uh, that I think is, I think that's the S. Is that Steve yes, the S car? Yes, the S15. Yeah. I think yeah. that's Steve's car. Yeah, so he is doing like a lovely little rolling burnout for the people there. Hand out the window, waving. Everybody loves a burnout. I think it's a universal thing, you know. So as the sun is just starting to drop down over the Eiffel Hills, we're coming to the end of our Falcon Drift Show. Becky, thank you very much indeed for joining me up here uh, in the booth. I've learned loads about this. I, I've, 
it's it's visually very spectacular and you don't actually need to know that much about it to look at it and know that we're having a good time and there's a lot of skill there but now that i've learned more i appreciate it even more thank you so much and when you go back down to the paddock will you thank all the lads and lasses down there I for us because wrong. that's been a top show tonight thank you so much it's been an honor to be up here in the iconic nervous ring at the north Schleifer here doing the drift show for falcon so thank you so much for having me and i will tell everyone that you enjoyed it i did uh, much in now I need to have a go now find it find a drift skill so that's fast Friday over and done with tomorrow get ready to go racing again with the BMW M2 legends we'll have that for you in sound and vision plus all the build-up to the 50th anniversary total energy ADAC 24 hours of Le Mans for Becky I'm John Hindoff thanks for being with us enjoy your Friday night everybody and we'll see you back here tomorrow bye 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 bye